Well, hello everyone. The Free Thought Society is pleased to present the very first Frigga Triska Decaphobia Treatment Center's International Education Seminar. My name is Dave Rice. I am a board member of the Free Thought Society, and I'm proud to introduce Ian Harris for a pre-event opening comedy sketch. Ian is a lifelong skeptic and comedian who has dedicated the last 10 years to doing comedy fueled by skepticism. He has performed at the American Humanist National Convention, the Reason Rally, and the Center for Skeptical Inquiry Convention. Ian has his own show every year at Dragon Con called the Science and Fiction Comedy Show. His comedy partner at Dragon Con is comedian Leanne Lord. You may have seen him on Jimmy Kimmel and on two one-hour comedy specials on Hulu and Prime, entitled Critical Thinking and the Extraordinary. We are sure you will enjoy the anti-superstition comedy stylings of Ian Harris. What's up, everybody? Ian Harris here, a comedian skeptic. It's uh, Friday the 13th. Um, I love Friday the 13th. Margaret, thanks for having this great show, as always. Um, uh, Friday the 13th is, is cool to me because as a skeptic, I just I think it's weird that people still believe in like bad luck and those kind of things. You know what I mean? Like like I mean we think that stuff's funny, but but it's like I actually know people who they freak out if they break a mirror or if they walk under a ladder or or whatever. Like most of us, like you know, we again we laugh at that stuff, but it makes me wonder like what do these people think is happening? Like what do they think is the mechanism behind this universal bad luck program, right? Like they must think that there's there's something that's that, that's causing it, right? Like 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 that there what are there a bunch of just like shitty asshole angels sitting up on a cloud somewhere, like doling out unusually cruel punishment for ridiculously trivial crimes? Like like why and how did they decide like like what was it what type of things got the bad luck, right? Like that's was there a committee? Like they were just like, okay, I think we, we everyone come to, yeah, we're all we're all good here. Okay, good. Um, really quick. So I think we've all come to the agreement that bad luck is the proper punishment, right? Uh, jail time, all that. None of that's really what's important. What's important is bad luck. We want to make sure that people get bad luck. That's the best, most appropriate form of punishment. Uh, we've all agreed, and we've all agreed also that. Seven years is the appropriate amount of bad luck. And uh, I, I, at least me personally, I love the irony that seven is most people's uh, lucky number. So it's kind of fun to give somebody a lucky number worth of bad luck. It's kind of a big fuck you right here. Here's your lucky number of bad luck, asshole, right? So I, th I think that's kind of cool. So we got seven years bad luck. But now we need to figure out what types of things should get seven years of bad luck, right? I mean, let, let's let's figure it out. We really, really need to figure out like what what are the the egregious things that are happening in humanity that, that deserve seven years of bad luck. So let's let's shoot it around the room. Who's got some ideas here? Uh, Tommy, Tommy, what do you got? Oh, I was. How about uh, murder? Murder? Tommy, does anybody even murder anymore? I mean, that's that's so hack, dude. No, 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 no. Every no, and people punish murder. That's uh, we need something else. We need something else. What do you got? How about you, Jen? What do you got? Um, I was thinking maybe. Maybe rape? Ah, <sighs> murder and rape. Rape, rape? Come on, Jen. You got to think outside your box. You know, no pun intended. But like, look, murder, rape. Come on, guys. I'm talking about the hardcore things. What's really causing the ails of society? What, what, what are the problems that 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 we just need to really deal with? That, that's bringing humanity down. Like, you know, like I'm thinking like the crazy stuff. Like. I don't know, like like breaking mirrors or uh, or walking under ladders. Like I mean, these are the things we've got to we've we've got to deal with. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, think about this. Like you look down there, see that guy? See there's a guy down there. His name is Bob. See that guy, Bob? That guy, Bob. Last week, okay, he broke a mirror. All right, like it was nothing. He just just like on my watch, no big deal. Just just kind of walk walk walks up, whatever. I shit you not. Okay, I couldn't believe it myself. And then I thought to myself, the gall of this guy, right? It sickens me that these humans these these days they don't even give a shit. Like they'll just cross the path of a black cat, and they don't even care about people. You know what I mean? It's like it's like I mean, look look at right, look at you see that? Did you see that right there? He just opened an umbrella indoors. I mean, on my watch, look. I'm done with this guy. I'm done with him. Like tomorrow, he loses his job and his wife cheats on him. I can't. I can't handle it anymore. Like the immorality of these of these these humans. Like seriously. I mean, you know, if something else happens, if he walks under a ladder again, just give him herpes. I mean, I'm done with these guys. Um, 
it, it always reminds me kind of of that whole like 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 the 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 secret thing. You guys remember the secret or or course of miracles? This whole idea where where you can think about things and the universe will grant them to you. They call it manifesting. I'm going to manif I'm going to think about something. If you want that relationship, you love that girl, you really want to meet that girl and have that relationship happen, you've got to think about it. You've got to put all of your time and energy into making that relationship happen. You've got to put every manifest the relationship. You've got to put all of your thoughts and time and energy into making that relationship happen. Uh, that's called stalking, all right? You can't do that. If you do that, the only thing that the universe is going to grant you is a restraining order, all right? Do not spend all of your energy on making a relationship happen. Or they would do that with jobs. They go, hey man, you want that job? You gotta think on it, you gotta manifest it, right? You gotta really wish for it and hope for it. But when I was a kid, I always heard the opposite superstition, right? It was always like, hey man, I went in for a, a job interview and uh, looks like I did really well and I think I might get it. And one asshole is always like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. That was the thing. If you talk about it, you jinx it, right? We, do you guys know what I'm talking about? We've all, we've all heard that. Like, I'm like, wait a second. What kind of weird, passive aggressive, bipolar, sadomasochistic nut job is running the universe, right? Like, like you can, like, we, if I think about something, it's going to give me all of my heart's desires, but the moment I speak it out loud, it's going to screw me in the ass forever. Like, what, what, why is that? That's, that's some sort of like, like it, it goes from some cosmic make-a-wish foundation to the cosmic take-a-wish foundation, right? For no apparent reason. Just like, okay, Billy, I uh, I see that you're dying of leukemia. I, uh, I'm very sorry to hear that, but we here at the Take a Wish Foundation, we're going to grant you anything you want, any any wish you desire. What is your, what is your heart's greatest desire? I just want you to think about your heart's greatest desire. Think about the one thing you want before you go. Just think about that one thing, Billy. Billy's like, wow. Well, I always wanted to uh, meet LeBron James. Like, Billy. Billy, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? I said, think about it. I didn't say talk about it, you idiot. Go, how could you do it? Oh man, you were this close to meeting LeBron, buddy, and now you screwed it up. Man, you went and jinxed it. I, I totally thought you knew the secret. I watch a lot of ghost shows. Um, here's a question. Why do all ghost encounters happen at the night? Right, in the nighttime, in the dark. The, the, you never hear about ghost encounters in the daytime. You've never, Every single one of those shows happens at night. Because it's like, yeah, that's the best way to conduct scientific research, right? Yes, we should all uh, sit around in a rundown hotel in the middle of the night with all the lights out, asking each other if they feel that. <gasps> Did you feel that? Ooh, my elbow got cold. Ooh, must be a, a spirit from the underworld, right? Like, that, that's... like. Hey man, why don't you come over tonight? Yeah, you know, bring a pizza, maybe a 1973 tape recorder. Uh, hey, give me that picture of the Virgin Mary and, and, and tape a magnet to it, and we'll see if we can figure out this whole Higgs boson thing. Yeah, that's not how science works, right? So, yeah, I was going to do some research on dark matter, but I left my uh, magic playing cards at Todd's last week while we were working on string theory. So, so much for that. Uh, yeah, you know, apparently that's how they came up with the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were just sat around in a cemetery all night going, Immunity, are you here? Immunity, talk to us. Immunity, make my elbow cold if you're here. That's that's how we that's how we got it. And we that's how we got co the COVID vaccine. Um, <laughs> I've never heard of a daytime haunting though. I've never seen it on one of these shows. And I was thinking, I'm like, man, are ghosts scared of the light? That was that. I was like, well, maybe ghosts are scared of the light. And then I started watching these shows, and I realized ghosts aren't scared of the light. Humans are scared of the dark. There you go. Um, uh, another thing I'm getting sick and tired of hearing about is the uh, the zombie apocalypse, right? Like people go, man, what are you gonna do when the zombie apocalypse happens? What about the zombie apocalypse? Now, I realize most people are are joking around. They don't really believe in a zombie apocalypse. But more and more, I'm hearing people that actually believe it. And I've had people say to me like, hey man, you don't know. You just never know. Zombie apocalypse is possible, man, because look, chemical warfares and maybe genetically engineered diseases and, 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 you know, nuclear war. You never know what could happen. You never know what could happen. I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. I never know what could happen. There could be some crazy catastrophic event that we've never seen before. There might be a meteor that hits the earth and does all kinds of weird stuff. But here's one thing that I do know that could never happen. Um, magic. 
Yeah, yeah, magic doesn't exist. So, we can't have zombies, because zombies can only happen if you got magic. Because, you see, zombies are the walking dead. They're they're the living dead, right? You, the people come, they die and they come back, and that's magic. No one's ever died and come back. Like when someone goes, oh, I died, I came back. No, 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 your heart stopped. Maybe you were sleeping. Maybe you took too much LSD and you were hallucinating. Maybe you, they had to, you know, put you on the defibrillator, bring you back. But no one's ever been brain dead, buried, and come back. It's never happened. It can't happen. That would be the what we call the living dead. And the living dead is an oxymoron. That's like... Uh, honest politician or interesting Mormon. These things don't exist in our realm. Um, but yeah, I mean, they just it couldn't happen. And and my biggest thing though is, why are we afraid of zombies? They're they're they are quite literally the slowest thing ever. They're so easy to get away with. Like, you know how they say in natural disasters, like if there's a fire, they say don't go back into your house and get the stuff. They say just leave. You're going to get more danger if you go back to the house, try to grab your stuff. They say just get out of there, right? Um, that's not true with a zombie apocalypse. Like, you could have a zombie right behind you and it'd be like, oh my God, zombie right behind you. Quick, get the things you, le you need, the things you like the most. Maybe uh, make yourself a quick snack and then power walk toward that door, man, because that zombie is right on your ass, right? That's, they're just slow. And also, what do they care about? Brains, that's it, brains, the brains. All they want is your brains. So, I don't know, wear a fucking helmet. How about that? Better yet, better than a helmet, wear one of those red MAGA, Make America Great Again hats, put one of those bad boys on, and then they'll be like, bruh, never mind. He's one of us, hey. See you at the Capitol. Conspiracy nuts are crazy. They're always like, hey man, you gotta follow the money, dude. You gotta follow the money, man. You gotta follow the money, right? You got big pharma, dude, cancer research. You gotta follow the money. But then they completely throw that out the window when it comes to, uh, I don't know, flat earth. Because what's what's the conspiracy there? What, what's the follow the money to keeping the world, to pretending that the world isn't spherical? What would, I, I don't understand what, right? They'd be like, no, man, you got to follow the money, dude. The Earth's totally flat, dude, and they're never going to let you know about it. Yeah, dude, because check it out, man. Did you know that the globe manufacturers make like tens of dollars a year manufacturing globes for elementary schools? Think about it, dude. The top three CEOs of the top three globe manufacturing companies only have to work Uber two days a week, bro. Yeah. Do you think Big Globe is going to let that kind of money slip away? <laughs> Not in this economy, dog. Not in this economy. My favorite one, I think, is when people have these like overreaching thing, like like, like these giant grandiose conspiracy type stuff, like, or like superstitions, like, like everything happens for a reason. People always say, hey, man, I know you're skeptic. I know you're, uh, you know, you don't believe in anything, but you got to believe this. Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. I'm like, I got to believe that? Really? I don't, I don't believe everything happens for a reason. I mean, I look, I understand cause and effect. I understand that if I don't put my brakes on, I might slam into the car in front of me. I understand that if I punch you in the face, you might fall down, get hurt, and come up and be angry and come out. I understand that, you know, actions have reactions. Um... But I don't believe it. They mean some grandiose universal thing. Like, the universe is looking out for me, man. Everything happens for a reason, right? Like, I always hear these goofy stories. You know what I'm talking about? You know people like this? They're like, yo, man, check it out, dude. Man, I lost my job the other day. But hey, it's okay, man. Everything happens for a reason, dude. Check it out, right? So I, I was late to work, right? Because I, you know, because I couldn't find my keys. Well, I got up in the morning, you know, and I like, I'm looking all over. Couldn't find anything. Like my alarm went off late, and then I, I couldn't find my shoes, and I'm looking all over. And finally, they were in my bathtub. I'm like, how did they get in there? Like when I came home from the bar, they were on my feet, you know. But whatever. And then I couldn't find my keys, man. I get back, I get out to the car, and I realize I don't have them, you know. And I'm like, oh man. So I gotta break into my house to find my keys, right? I finally find them, and uh, I get in the car. I get on the freeway. 20 car pile up, 50 people dead. And that's when I realized, man, if I had had my keys, I'd have been right in the middle of that and I'd be dead. Whew. Someone was looking out for me. Everything happens for a reason. I'm like, yeah, because if I'm God and I don't want you to die in a horrific car accident because the world needs a 
solid Denny's waiter or whatever the fuck it is you do. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide your keys to delay you for an extra three minutes because as an all-powerful, all-loving being, that makes far more sense and is far more logical than say, oh, I don't know, how about I just don't murder 20 people on the freeway? <laughs> that's crazy. Why would I not do that? Um, and what about that? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe... 20 people died on the freeway, right? Because you left your keys at home, you dick. Yeah, you ever think about that? No, you didn't, did you? No, you only think about yourself. Uh, but look, I actually think it's a great idea. I would love it if everything happened for a reason. I always thought it'd be cool if everything happened for the same reason, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Like, think about it, it'd be a sports game, be like, and uh, Tom Brady drops back, he fires a shot across the middle, it's caught, 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Buccaneers win the Super Bowl! Buccaneers win the Super Bowl! Tom Brady, how do you feel at this moment? Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh man, my 400th Super Bowl! Uh, this is amazing. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, well, gonna, before I go any further, though, before I do anything, I have to thank the one person responsible. We all know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I gotta thank the guy responsible. I gotta thank Ian. Because if he hadn't left his keys at home that day, none of this would have been possible. <laughs> Let's go over and talk to the, uh, to the losing uh, Las Vegas Raiders. It was a tough game, guys. Uh, how do you feel? Yeah, yeah, it was a really tough game. I mean, you know, we, we, we thought we had some stuff going. We didn't, you know. We, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're sure it would have been nice if he hadn't left his keys at home that day. We'd be over there in that winter circle right now. But, uh, you know, we just... We gotta go back to the drawing board. We gotta figure some things out. And we'll come back next year. We'll come back stronger. Because, uh, you know what they say. Everything happens for the reason. Uh, I, of course, don't believe any of that stuff because I'm an atheist. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine said to me the other day, he goes, man, he goes, let me tell you something, man. He goes, you know the problem with you atheists? He goes, you're willfully ignorant. To which I responded, I was like, oh, yeah? Well, you know the problem with you theists is? You don't understand ironic statements. Hey, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret, for having me. Happy Friday the 13th. Go break some ears. Go walk under some ladders. Cross some black cats. Do whatever the fuck you want to do, because it's all bullshit, and you know it. Um, have fun. See y'all. Oh, and but tomorrow, Saturday the 14th, whoa. Stay at home. Well, hello, and welcome, everyone. My name is Margaret Downey. I'm the founder and president of the Free Thought Society. I've been a Frigatriscodecophobia Treatment Center nurse practitioner for 20 years. It is my pleasure to be your co-host for today's event, along with Dave Rice, who introduced the pre-event comedian, Ian Harris. Ian is so funny and very generous. Ian donated his time to support the Free Thought Society. So a big thank you to Ian Harris. I'm going to kick off the event with the uh, breaking of a mirror. With the breaking of the mirror, I'm declaring the official start of the Anti-Superstition Frigatriscodecophobia Treatment Center's International Educational Seminar. Now I'm gonna put on my safety glasses. And here we go. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Woo! There it goes. Yikes! There's proof. <laughs> Yay! Third time's a charm. Is uh, that superstitious? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Margaret. That's a great way to start. And I know you don't hold any associated mirror breaking superstitions. Uh, thanks for representing all us rational thinking attendees. Uh, to this event today. And now Margaret will tell you a little bit about the Free Thought Society. The Free Thought Society serves as a local forum in which free thinkers can meet, socialize, and exchange ideas. So on the screen, you will see a list of Free Thought Society volunteer opportunities, and we hope one of the committees will be of interest to you. We would welcome your participation. The mind of a freethinker is not restrained by superstitions or prescribed dogmas that tell us what we can and cannot think. While some today would suppress independent thought, freethinkers know that the unrestricted exchange of ideas have been the primary forces of progress in all civilizations. 
As free thinkers, we want to better ourselves and our community through the unrestrained application of reason and human endeavor to address the local and global problems that confront us. The Free Thought Society is a nonprofit 501c3 educational organization. And this is why we hope you'll be moved to make a donation today. The link is very simple. It is ftsociety.org slash donate. And today, the suggested donation is $13. But if you really want to help, please reverse the numbers and donate $31. We are now starting the formal Frigatriska Decaphobia Treatment Center's educational seminar. The first presentation features Babu Goganini, who will talk about superstitions that prevail to this day in his birthplace, India. Babu is an Indian humanist, rationalist, and human rights activist who served as executive director of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. Babu is also the founder of the South Asian Humanist Association and Indian Humanists. Babu currently lives in Australia. We are now pleased to present Babu Goganini. Hello, I'm Babu Goganini. Thank you for joining me in this brief overview about superstition, belief, and a bit of humanism in India. India is an ancient civilization, one of the great civilizations of human history, but it's a young country. This year, we celebrate 75 years of India's independence and much less of its time as a republic since when we had a constitution. Uniquely for the world's constitutions, India's constitution in its article 51 AH, which is the fundamental duties of all Indians, very clearly exhorts and enjoins all citizens to develop humanism, not of course what we mean by humanism in the humanist movement, but also scientific temper and also the spirit of social reform. Why did we need to have that particular thing put in the Indian constitution? Why should India's constitution tell her citizens that it is the duty of every citizen to promote scientific temper? Now, that's because the country really is a living museum of superstitions ancient, modern. They just grow by accretion. Nothing gets discarded, but more things keep getting added. Now, India is 1.4 billion people. India is nearly 1 billion Hindus. And India has more Muslims than there are in all of the Islamic Middle East. So we are talking big numbers. We are talking 200 million, 250 million people and so on. So we are talking big numbers and we are talking big problems as well. Now between the year 2000 and 2016, according to the National Crime Records Bureau statistics, 2,500 women were killed by villagers which means they would have been chased, captured, tortured, and killed in various cruel ways on suspicion that they were practicing witchcraft. Now, this is the number of women. Usually, as many men as women are killed in this ritualistic torture and murder. The magical concept of the universe, which could mean a talisman, which could mean a colored stone in your ring. It could mean changing the spelling of your name so that according to what they call numerology, you might get better luck in life. Now, how an Indian name 
can be corrected through an English spelling being changed. I don't know, but people are not thinking. They have very simply the magical concept of the universe. So in many rural areas, outside their homes are pieces of cut lime and some chili and maybe some turmeric, ingredients that really make a good biryani. But if you find these outside your house, that means you have been the target of someone who wants you dead or who wants you harmed. That's black magic. And the only way to address that would be to go to a black magic man to identify who may have wanted you harmed. Now that may mean paying the black magic man to light a fire. And as the wind blows, whichever direction the smoke is pointing to, there might be a childhood quarrel that you had with someone or a recent dispute you had with someone living there. That guy is now your target. But instead of doing black magic on them, which would have been all right, you now will identify the person and go and attack and kill. The number would be roughly 5,000 people killed like that. There are several witchcraft murders that I and my colleagues have been able to prevent because we set up some early warning signs in villages. And there are times when we went a bit late. There are times when my colleagues were also tied up in the village and they wanted to kill these people too because they were trying to help the suspected witches and sorcerers. So this is the story of serious superstition. I am not thinking of the nearly 3 billion rupees worth business that is being done in the name of astrology, in the name of palmistry, more money to be counted there, in the name of talismans and colored stones. These are the remedies to everyday problems of life that are advertised on television from four to six nearly every day in the afternoon. And at seven o'clock, they call rationalists like me. And the television hosts ask us, why do you think superstitions are so rampant in the country? That's their business model. That's the social atmosphere in which we rationalists and fellow humans, religious people, live in the country. It is a very, very discouraging situation. Now, as I said, there are so many people who are killed, so many who are attacked, and there are so many who have not yet been killed, who escaped some of the largest displacements of people, not well documented, but at least once counted by a UN estimate, for people around the world is tens of millions of people in Papua New Guinea, in Haiti, in all of Africa, and in many parts of Asia, including India and Nepal, where people have fled their homes because they have been named as witches and sorcerers, and that is a death sentence, so people escape. Now, there are other occasions when people leave their homes. For example, not one example, many of them. Someone cites a ghost in a village and then the village evacuates. Mind you, this is peacetime. There has been no natural calamity, no famine, no flood, no fire. It's just that someone suspects that the village is haunted. In a country where 
30% of the people do not have proper houses, housing. A village with people living in houses is evacuated. Children stop going to school. Men and women stop working because they want to save their lives. They want to be away from the ghosts. The remedy to that is animal sacrifice and sometimes human sacrifice. It's not widely reported, but human sacrifice is not uncommon. Though it's nowhere near the frightening levels 30 years or 40 years ago. As I said, sometimes we manage to go to the village, to the place with the police before it happens. But it's not always the case. Now, belief, most religious belief is really superstition. But it damages you more when it is linked with the magical concept of the universe. Now, the constitution says to us Indians that we should fight against superstition, that we should improve scientific knowledge. People who do that, people who listen to the exhortation of the Indian constitution, the rationalists, the humanists, the science popularizers. Very often, they are termed anti-national. They're called anti-national because the idea of nation and belief, religious belief, are linked up in the new enthusiasm of the extreme right wing. There are laws in the Indian Penal Code which protect the religious people from blaspheming of their gods, as if the gods cannot protect themselves. Then a criticism of religion might create unrest in society. Therefore, society should be protected. A critical evaluation of the religious texts, a debunking of a claim of miracles can not always but can very often lead you to being charged to start with someone to file a police complaint against you. Sometimes for the police to investigate and conclude that indeed you have been committing crime and then charge you with the crime. The crime could be, as I said, the equivalent of blasphemy. It is called hurting the religious sentiments of sections of society. So that's Article 295A. Uh, there are perfectly legitimate laws which stop people from going and playing havoc or disturbing a prayer at a place of prayer in a temple, a mosque. I'm not talking that. If you were to tweet, write on Facebook or write a long essay, or write a book, then people might say that you have been hurting their religious sentiments. So it's not disturbing somebody in the act of prayer. It's simply you expressing your thoughts. Because all free expression is subject to public order and morality. Also, in a country with a billion Hindus, 250 million Muslims or 200 million Muslims. And 3% of India is Christian. All people have to be careful not to provoke people of other religions, not to create unrest in society. And of course, when you do these things, you have conspired to do it. So under Indian Penal Code, Section 120 for conspiracy, 153A for creating disturbance in society, um, creating unrest amongst classes of people in society, and then hurting the religious sentiments of people by 295A. 
So the police can charge you with these crimes. And then, of course, if nation and belief are the same, when you do something, when you say something against belief, then you've done something against the nation and therefore you are an anti-national. Usually the anti-national for the Hindus is someone funded by the Muslims and the rich Christians who live abroad, the evangelical Christians who come to India and perform miracles and make the blind see and the deaf hear and the dumb speak. So the rationalists are now categorized into anti-nationals funded by foreign religions. Foreign religions. Even if Christianity came to India much before it reached Europe, even before Islam came to parts of India, much before it started its conquering zeal with the sword. But that's about history. But who wants history when mythology is so available. Mythology tells us that between India and Sri Lanka, now in a great crisis, there was a bridge built by Lord Rama, an avatar of Lord Vishnu, a human incarnation of the God, who along with a troop of talking monkeys built a bridge connecting India and Sri Lanka, on which they walked to go and rescue um, the kidnapped consort uh, of Lord Rama. Now to build, a, to build a seaway between the two countries, some dredging needs to be done. But of course, dredging will not be allowed because that's a sacred bridge. And therefore, now you have to go around 400 kilometers for each naval journey because those 30 kilometers which have sand and it's a sand reach, if that were to be dredged, then you would save so much. But no, you can't allow, you can't allow modern developments interfere with your beliefs, your beliefs that everything in mythology is really history. And therefore, national energies are spent looking into, like Noah's Ark was looked for, and I think National Geographic, after ownership changed to the right-wingers, seems to indicate that they have found Noah's Ark and so on. There are other things to find in India, and they do that. And then there is a belief, superstitious belief, that ancient India already knew everything that modern science is still looking for. All you have to do is open the Vedas and find in them verses in ancient Sanskrit, which you can interpret in modern language to say that here is quantum theory. And there, that is where Newton copied uh, his ideas about gravitation from. And the prime minister of the country, at the inauguration of a modern hospital, reminded everyone in the country and those watching and listening, um, was it not the case of Lord Shiva who decapitated a child and when the child's mother was in distress, went and got, well, he saw an elephant lying down, sleeping somewhere. He chopped off the head of the elephant, brought the head and transplanted it on the cadaver of the decapitated, the trunk of the boy and gave life to the child. Now with a child's body and an elephant's head. And the prime minister said, this is the finest example as proof of the existence of the knowledge of plastic surgery already in ancient India. And of course, what did the Wright brothers do anew, which 3000 years ago already was not explained and probably practiced, 
by the seer Bharadvaja. Uh, it doesn't matter that the description of aviation as it is in Bharadvaja's writings leads to a pear-shaped body with bird's wings to the side. Good imagination, but understood as science today. Now, what is wrong with that? Why is it a problem to think that ancient people already knew what we know now? The problem is, because if everything was already known and is inscribed and preserved in the holy books, got to us by revelation, then why should we even study modern science? We just have to go back to the ancient books, learn a bit of Sanskrit and focus our energies into that. Universities have started more than they have, let's say, 15 years ago, introducing courses in geomancy, vastu or feng shui, uh, in astrology. These are arts degrees which are used by those who finish those studies as professional qualifications and they set up business. Uh, helpfully, there are now witchcraft courses in a couple of universities and it will spread. It will spread and the continued cretinization of Indian society where there is 30% illiteracy and 30% illiteracy of 1.4 billion people is more than the combined populations of Spain, France, Greece, Italy, the United Kingdom and Germany. So many people illiterate but access to television and some of them literate of the remaining able to read WhatsApp messages, short, short lies that come to the recipients. India being the largest consumer of mobile phone internet and consumers of social media. Uh, we are talking 400 million users of Facebook and similar numbers, I think, of WhatsApp. These being the vehicles for spreading ancient superstition. Now, because everything is already in the Vedas, because there's no need to learn new things, and the Prime Minister already told us that this is all ancient knowledge, it brings a kind of reluctance in the nation to explore things, to find out the truth about things. And when you do not have the interest to know the truth, you will also not have the honesty to tell it. Now, when the coronavirus was first identified in China, 2019, towards the end of the year, and already the WHO made its announcements in January, the manufacturer of one of the, of the largest manufacturer of vaccines in India, Shanta, Shanta Biotech, its founder and the company's chief, went on to YouTube, a channel, and said, those people eat things that we don't eat. In India, there are special vibrations and that will protect us. People throughout the country said, the Chinese eat bats and tadpoles and frogs and we don't do that. We don't even eat beef. Why will we get this virus? Just like they said, India had special powers and AIDS would do nothing to India. Scientists, Serious scientists, many of them humanists, were warning the government of India. The government of India and the others in society said, no, that's not an Indian problem. That's for the decadent West with all their fornication and their extramarital affairs and so on and so forth. It's nothing that will 
effect a morally correct nation like India. And India happened to be one of the largest victims of AIDS. At the end of the pandemic, we count the numbers and the humanists are not surprised. Now, as the pandemic was progressing in the country, people were told, like they were told in Babylonia 4,500 years ago, that when there was an epidemic of any kind, you had to go with your pots and pans and clay things and bang them in the street and throw them down. And then whatever was causing the illness would die. The same thing was tried in 2020 in India. People came, this is the metal age, no longer the time of uh, the ancients. So they had dishes that they could beat on and which would make noise. And then people knew words like vibration and ultrasound and sonic and so on. So they borrowed these words from modern science to say that by doing this, these vibrations will kill the virus. It's not, it's not very ordinary people spreading this. India's biggest superstar in the Hindi language, Amitabh Bachchan, once a member of parliament, he was the one who came on and he said, bang your dishes and then your plates and pans and together we will fight the virus. It was a national frenzy, a national frenzy. And then the power of the word. After all, if God said, let there be something and it was there, wasn't the primal sound, Om, which created the universe. Is that not the sound that NASA scientists found out was emanating from the sun? Yeah, they believe that. They seek justification for every belief from NASA, who they claim, they claim, employs 30% Indians in its workforce. Of course, not true. But who is bothered about the truth? They're in this national frenzy, in this national frenzy that the sound can help. A member of parliament, uh, another deputy minister, along with the Chinese consul general, stood by the beach in Mumbai and chanted, Go, Corona, go. Go, Corona, go. This is a song meant to tell the coronavirus to behave itself so that it would leave the holy land. Now, there are obviously obvious reasons why this did not work. The virus comes from China. Now, if you were to sing something in Indian English, how would the Chinese virus ever understand what you were saying? I mean, a more intelligent thing would have been to learn how to sing this in either Mandarin or Cantonese, but the wrong tactic was used and the virus went nowhere. People, like in South Africa once, the president of the country prescribed Tabo Mbeki, prescribed that lemon juice was a good remedy for AIDS. In India, uncontrolled, unregulated, and wild remedies were being proposed. Fenugreek, jaggery, ginger, uh, holy basil, all these to be put in your food so that your immunity levels will go up. And some of the ministers of the government encouraging this. After all, the virus is Chinese and what did the Westerners ever do? And we have ancient traditional medicine in the country. So let's deploy that against the virus. Cow urine has been used as a sanitizing solution. 
Cow urine has magical properties. If you don't try, you will never know. But the ones who have tried it, they've also sprayed it on people unsuspecting. What else can I tell you about how bad things have been in my country, which is one-sixth of humanity, which lost the direction that knowledge would give, which abjured and rejected the light that science can throw on life, living, and how we might make it better for people in the country and everywhere through false claims, through fake pride in the past, in a country where government announced 450,000 deaths because of corona and which just last week the WHO confirmed to be 4.7 million people dead because of coronavirus pandemic. The really damaging effects of superstition are those that damage life. They don't let you live peacefully, always in fear of a number, a lucky day, a charm, a colored stone, some lines on the hand. And things like this. Already Indian society is divided along the lines of caste. That also is founded on superstition, on the superstition that humans are born from different parts of the Lord Creator. So the intelligence ones from the head, the powerful ones from the shoulders, the businessmen from the thighs, the workmen, the tradies from the feet. And then there are those who are the castless, because they're not even human, they're untouchable. The number of people treated as untouchables in the Indian subcontinent is of the order of 200 million people. There is affirmative action. Many have found limited succor, but definitely succor. Some protection from discrimination from the atrocity of being treated as untouchables because of laws, not always well implemented, but the laws are in place. Unlike Nigeria, where unconnected with the Hindu religion, there is untouchability. You could be Osu and you would be untouchable in Nigeria. There is a law there, but there's no prosecution either. India does better. Japan, Shinto Japan, after it adopted Buddhism, introduced untouchability for the butchers of the region. They did not stop eating meat, but the butchers became untouchable. And they have been around. And the Buraku people, the Buraku mean, continue to be there in Japan, but Japan has no legislation. India has the law. India has a lot of prosecution of the violation of the rights of the untouchables, the Dalits, as some people prefer to call themselves, the marginalized, the vulnerable. So at a legislative level in the constitution, there have been attempts to make things better for humans living in India. But it's humans who have to implement the law, but with religious fanaticism, social backwardness, cultural backwardness in large sections of the population, inadequate appreciation of the values of equality, of human dignity. We find that things are lacking, wanting. When you don't 
have adequate appreciation of the values that keep civilization going, then you end up being high in the hunger index with malnourished children. Schools now in India, almost everywhere in the country, have a midday meal scheme where the school gives food to the child. Actually, one of the reasons why many children go to school is that at least they are fed there. Religious fundamentalism, religious prejudice against, taboos against food means that these children, undernourished, protein deprived, can't even have egg in their meals because the ones making these policies or implementing them have been told because of their caste upbringing that people of their caste cannot eat eggs or meat. Malnutrition is a big problem. Big superstition, huge problem. Indian children have stunted growth. Indians, male or female, even when they are able to afford it, are very limited in their ability to eat nutritious, balanced diet. Because religion, ignorance, consequent superstition has created these hurdles. Because you believe that there are truths in ancient Indian thinking, you believe that astrology is more important than astronomy. Astrology is what you use to understand the course of your life in the years ahead and also what you use to choose and to confirm compatibility with others that you would consider for a life mate. So marriages are between horoscopes, not humans. It damages life. It humiliates people. Superstition has been doing it successfully in the country. I said to you that those who try to oppose this are often the victims of oppression, of aggressive response, sometimes of foolishness from the authorities. Almost every rationalist, every humanist, every science popularizer, not almost every, who has been charged, they're all accused, a few are charged, and then the matter goes to court. No court has ever, no court of law has ever, ever punished a rationalist or uh, anti-superstition activist for what they did. In fact, a judge in the Karnataka state, he made a police inspector apologize in court for having prosecuted a person who was spreading science, saying the constitution says spread science. And when that is done, how dare you punish this person? So the judges, mostly, there are some judges who've said foolish things, even while on the bench. But overall, they have been a protection. But when the mob takes over, and the police, even if not colluding, do not consider it a priority, then great disasters are visited on the rationalists. Superstition doesn't simply hurt those who believe in it, but also those who do not believe in it and therefore fight against it. Dr. Narendra Dhabolkar, a senior rationalist leader, a thousand times more gentle than I and many of my colleagues, was gunned down by young people, he was in his late 60s, because he called for a law which would outlaw not the belief in superstition, but those who run a business based on superstitious beliefs. Dr. Dhabalkar is not the only one. 
Gauri Lankesh, a lady who fought against unexamined beliefs in society, gunned down. Professor Kalburgi, vice chancellor of a university, former retired vice chancellor, not even a humanist, but broadly a rationalist, killed. Dr. Govind Pansare, assassinated as well. I looked into the history of people who have been charged like this. Many of them happen to be those who hold secular views. They are not punished by the court, but in India, the process is the punishment. A case takes many, many years before it comes to resolution. And the riffraff who believe in rebirth, the, who believe in, the belief is not that of a riffraff nature, that would be of ignorance, but who have then weaponized the law to attack those who were spreading knowledge about these beliefs that are being held. They are not being controlled. So you can peddle cow urine and cow dung as remedies. Some people are now making a public display of consuming the fecal matter of cows as a sacred duty, as a medicine. There are new formulations that are being released based on cow urine. As I said, the cretinization of the country is continuing. The ones who are protesting happen to be persecuted, attacked, vilified as anti-national. And in a country where resurgent right-wing religious fundamentalism is taking over, it becomes an unsafe thing to espouse the cause of reason. That's where we are. The humanist colleagues that I work with are a source of great inspiration and courage for the civilizational values that we espouse. The ones who have rejected reason, compassion, solidarity of the human, those who have no longer any time for reasonableness and accommodation, they are surprisingly also the ones who are religious fundamentalists, fanatics, militant nationalists. All of these ideas, these stances, these beliefs are based on a superstitious understanding, inadequate knowledge of both the human and the universe. I hope you've got a glimpse of the great challenges the thousands of my colleagues in India are braving, not giving up. After Dabulkar was assassinated, they thought that the humanists would now keep quiet. The rationalists would do nothing. No, within months of that assassination, there were meetings around the country especially in the cities where right-wing fundamentalism is rampant, where the rationalists met together and declared a national day for atheism, for humanism, obviously against superstition. So the rationalists have not lost courage. They just find that the challenge has become bigger with the government and it's not one political party. Government throughout the country has been in favor of protecting, condoning, or letting go all offenses if they are performed, committed in the name of religion or belief. That's where we are. Google. Google the words rationalism, humanism, threats to rationalists. Join the humanist groups. 
in my name there is a facebook group my timeline on facebook as that and that will connect you to hundreds of rationalists in the country follow what is happening and you will see that while there is much to despair because of the tremendous challenges we are facing there is much to be inspired by when you see people who are fighting superstition and defending science democracy human rights thank you for your attention thank you very much uh, babu for that very insightful and i must say sobering uh, presentation our next presenter is free thought society board member norm r allen from 1989 to 2013 norm was the first and only full-time african american humanist traveling the world promoting humanism skepticism and free thought he has edited two books and written numerous articles for journals books and encyclopedias he has appeared in the media on bbc radio c span national public radio fox news and many other media outlets today norm is here to talk about the harmful superstitions that prevail in africa welcome norm uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I am not an expert on superstitions in Africa, but pretty much what I want to discuss are my personal experiences and some of the knowledge that I have about those superstitions in Africa. One of the biggest superstitions, uh, like in India, as, as Babu was talking about earlier, is the superstition around witchcraft. In Africa, uh, they still believe in witches. They believe that primarily uh, women or girls or, or witches, and they also believe in warlocks. And so because of this uh, belief, a, a lot of these beliefs have been exacerbated by the fact that there are many evangelical Christians promoting their religion throughout Africa, and a lot of people are buying into it. And uh, of course, you have not only problems with uh, witchcraft, but other problems uh, in the way of uh, sexuality, homosexuality, and what have you. But witchcraft is a serious problem. And as far as us trying to combat it, uh, we had a, an anti-superstition campaign, which originated in Nigeria in about 2010, I believe. We were putting on seminars trying to educate people uh, throughout the continent that we had expert seminars in Nigeria, in Ghana, and, and in other nations. And uh, these seminars have had a, a pretty profound impact, but still it's really difficult because these are deep-seated beliefs. And so we have our share of skeptics and humanists, just as India does, but we really are up against the lot. We have had many people going around the, the entire African continent, and some of them have even come to the United States trying to raise money and awareness of what's going on in that continent. On a related note, there is the belief that people can harvest the organs of, of albinos albinos have been uh, killed and their organs have been harvested in nations such as Tanzania. And uh, this is also a serious problem, uh, another problem that uh, African skeptics have been trying to combat. Uh, many people, as I said, have been killed, uh, they have been persecuted, and it's, it's very difficult for albinos over there uh, in, in many parts of Africa. That problem doesn't get as much attention as the problem with witchcraft, but it's very closely related and it's something that African skeptics have been fighting against for several years. Now, there are a lot of relatively harmless African superstitions, some of which I will discuss uh, later on. One of them, for example, is in Uganda. In Uganda, there's this idea that girls should not eat eggs. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that superstition came about, but uh, that's one of those food superstitions. And there are many throughout the African continent in which certain people or uh, girls, women, what have you, are not allowed to eat certain foods. And uh, of course, uh, this is a problem, not only because it's merely superstitious, but uh, in a lot of cases, people are not getting the right nutrition that they need because they are afraid to eat these certain foods. So this is a case of superstition, which might sound kind of funny or kind of silly, uh, which has very negative consequences for the people who are victimized by it. When I was in Africa, uh, well, actually, I made seven trips to Africa and visited nine African nations. Back in about 2009, I went to Uganda 
and I went to Gambia. And I met with, uh, well, I guess you would call them juju priests or traditional healers, uh, people, magic men, if you will, in these nations. And it was a very interesting because a lot of these magic men are highly revered throughout African uh, countries, and, uh, more so in the rural areas than in the cities. But I was able to meet with some of these uh, magic men and they have a lot of things such as charms, charms which are supposed to give you magical powers. They're supposed to provide you with healing. They're supposed to improve your health. They're supposed to bring you wealth. Uh, they're supposed to help you find love, and marriage, and happiness, and what have you. As I was saying, I was in Gambia, and I was in Uganda, and I met with some of these uh, traditional medicine men. And I got to go in, in there. I got to have uh, what you would call readings. Uh, they were supposed to be able to tell me about my future. They were supposed to be able to tell me about my past. They were supposed to be able to tell me how I could improve my life. They gave me various charms. If, of course, some of that stuff actually panned out. Uh, as it turned out, they didn't really know much about me. Uh, the predictions they made about me never came true. And so it was pretty much uh, a waste of time. But what's interesting is that so many of these healers uh, get people to come in to them, to give them money, but you can look at their lives and see that they don't have any special uh, gifts or they don't have any, any special lives that people would envy. For example, most of them are poor. Uh, most of them are, are living in, in huts. Uh, most of them have bad health. A lot of times they'll tell you that if you come to them, they can give you these charms, which will help you get to the United States or some other wealthy nation, but they've never even left uh, their own village. So a lot of the times, all you have to do is look at these people's lives and see that what they profess to be able to do, they simply cannot do. But sometimes it gets very difficult uh, because a lot of times what's involved is animal abuse. For example, I was told that if I wanted to have a particular uh, goal achieved, what I would have to do is break a live chicken's legs. And so, you know, these, these, this type of animal abuse is something that goes on on a regular basis among people. And so it's not just a matter of what happens to human beings, but what happens to other humans. And uh, to, this, to this end, many of the skeptics in Africa have been trying to educate the public. When I returned from Africa, I brought some of these charms back. And if you're interested in seeing some of these charms and what they're supposed to help you accomplish, uh, I left these charms with my former colleague, Joe Nickel of the Center for Inquiry. And he has a very nice display in which he has all types of charms all over the world. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some of those charms, you can visit the Center for Inquiry in Amherst, New York. Also, um, when I was in Uganda, I had a very interesting experience because we had the Ugandan Humanist Association. They had a, a school, in fact, now they have a, a few schools, but they had a, a humanist school and they were trying to get people from the area to support the school and they were trying to get children from the area to attend the school. But what happened was it was very difficult in the beginning because the school was located in an area near woods and these woods were said to have been haunted. And so many of the children were not allowed to go to that school because their parents thought this, the area is haunted by evil spirits. And so it took a lot of time for, uh, for humanists in that area to educate the people, to let the, the people know that their children really need to be involved. The children can come out and that there is, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong there. This is another example in which people are using superstitions to actually harm themselves and to drive themselves away from the education that they need to improve their lives. Uh, back in 2007, I believe, we had our first skeptics conference in Africa, and that took place in Senegal. And it was a very uh, good conference. It was well attended by people throughout Africa. Uh, there were some people from France, there were some people from Europe and, and other, other nations, and uh, it went over very well. And uh, we were able to educate people in schools. We were able to go to elementary schools, talk to, talk to students about the importance of being skeptical, about the importance of critical thinking. We were able to share uh, skeptical books and liter other forms of literature with these people. And so uh, that was, uh, I think, a very historic event. 
uh, because prior to that time, we had humanists over there. We had uh, we had atheists and free thinkers, but this was the first time that there was an emphasis upon skepticism as we know it in the United States, which is primarily dealing with skepticism of untested claims to knowledge regarding uh, the paranormal. That was a very successful conference. It was our first time that we were able to make inroads into the African continent uh, with skeptics. And we were also able to even get on television and that uh, we really were able to, to spread the word, not only among elementary school students and high school students, but among the university level as well. So that was an, a very important event and very historic event. And it was attended by people such as uh, Leo Igwe of Nigeria. I was there and was also attended by the person who was primarily responsible for putting it together, and that's Vidal Neon. He's actually a physicist from Senegal. And so uh, we had a, a very good um, very good turnout and we, had, uh, uh, we were able to publicize it well. And uh, as a result, uh, Africa was able to get its first, its first conference and its, its first real experience with organized skepticism on the continent. In my earlier book, my edited book, African American Humanism and Anthology, I have an excellent article in there by one of our former humanist activists. His name is Emmanuel Kofi Menza. He's from Ghana, but he did most of his work in Nigeria. And he founded the organization Action for Humanism. In this organization, uh, he was uh, doing a very good job going throughout Nigeria. This is this is before the Nigerian humanists that we know of today. This is what one of the uh, earliest humanist groups in Nigeria. It, it was a very good uh, experience I had over there. And this person, Emmanuel Kofi Menza, he wrote an excellent article for my first anthology. And in that article, he was talking about the various superstitions that you're likely to find in Africa. And I'd like to read a little bit from that to, to give you an, an idea of exactly what he was up against back in the early 1990s. Now he was talking about how Africa has all of these various different ethnic groups. Not only do they have to deal with Christianity and Islam, but there are a lot of indigenous beliefs that they're up against. And it's, it, was, it was very challenging for them to uh, be able to have to go out into the world. But at that time, uh, there were no, no huge humanist groups in Africa. There, was, there were two in Nigeria. There was Action for Humanism, and there was the Humanist Friendship Center in another part of the country. So uh, they were up against all of this superstition, all of this organized religion, Islam, Christianity, the indigenous African religions, but they did persist. He wrote an excellent article on what he was up against and, and what he had to face. Now he was talking about uh, what goes on in Africa as far as the, how superstition is so deeply rooted in every aspect of their lives. Okay, he, was, he has written that uh, whatever the African does has a direct or indirect religious undertone. The traditional religion with its attendant legends, myths, and magic, and the foreign-oriented religion with its beliefs and irrational faith negatively affected the progress of the individual and the community. Take a case in Ghana, for example. There was a guinea worm epidemic in one area. A borehole was dug for the village by the United Nations through the auspices of the World Health Organization and UNICEF to help avert the riverborne disease. It was later learned, however, that the villagers were not using the borehole because they claimed the river, which runs through the village and was causing their problem, was better than the borehole for drinking and for domestic usage. They alleged that the gods lived in the river and that anybody who shunned the river would eventually die. Consequently, they clung to the religious beliefs and the epidemic continued. So here's an example of superstition actually spreading a health, a health crisis, a major health crisis, because people will not understand or cannot understand that rather than be worried about supposed spirits, they need to be first and foremost worried about getting good education, thinking rationally, and looking out for their own best interests. But so often when I was in Africa, I ran into people who were more interested in defending their culture, their traditions, than they were in trying to lead good, rational lives. This is something that I ran up against repeatedly. The humanists there, the skeptics there in Africa, 
they still persisted and persist to this day. Emmanuel Kofi Mensa uh, was also talking about uh, the various uh, ceremonies and rituals which have a very negative effect on the development in numerous parts of Africa. And so over there, you have all different types of ceremonies. Some of them are benign, some, uh, but some of them are extremely dangerous. And, and a lot of them have to do with trying to uh, perform exorcisms. So this type of a problem was very widespread. But again, uh, we were able to, to have various seminars to, to try to educate people against uh, this type of superstition. Uh, what I also decided to do here was to go online and discuss some of the superstitions that exist in, in Africa today. For example, in certain countries such as Kenya and Uganda, you'll have various superstitions which aren't necessarily promoted in other African nations. Now in Kenya, for example, in the village of Kakamega in Kenya, many believe that geese have the ability to detect witches. And so for this reasons, many people in this particular village will have flocks of geese. And it's believed that these geese will somehow be able to ward off witches and make people's lives a lot better. Okay, now at the US, we have this belief that if you have an itchy palm, you're about to come to some money. However, uh, this belief takes on it goes in a bit of a different direction than Kenya. And so their belief is that if you have an itchy hand and if your right palm is itching and you scratch it, then you'll actually be scratching away the money that's supposed to come to you. So, uh, so if you do have an itchy palm, they believe, don't scratch it. Because if that happens, well, <laughs> you know, your money is bound to go away from uh, also, it is considered in Kenya to be bad luck if you see an owl. And it, it's like this, uh, not only with owls, but in, there are a lot of other superstitions where if you see a particular animal, you're supposed to somehow have bad luck. But if one sees an owl, it's considered a good idea to throw salt into a fire. If you throw salt into a fire, that's supposed to make the bad luck go away. Now, in the U.S., it is considered bad luck to step on a crack. You know, the old saying, if you step on a crack, you break your mother's back. In Uganda, though, uh, it's considered good luck if you step on an egg after you have been released from the hospital before going home. Uh, for some reason, it's believed that by stepping on an egg, uh, good luck will come your way. It's also believed that uh, if you um, are returning from prison or jail and you step on an egg, then you won't go back to prison for that exact same offense. So uh, there's, there are a lot of various egg superstitions throughout Eastern Africa in particular. Now in Uganda, uh, if a woman eats a twin banana uh, and she gets pregnant, it's believed that she will have twins and the twins will will be impervious to witches. That is to say that uh, uh, witches will not be able to work their powers on these twins. And that is as long as the parents take good care of the twins. If the parents abuse the twins or neglect the twins, then uh, all bets are off in that regard. Uh, also in Uganda, if you eat uh, in a dark room, you are eating with demons. So this, so this belief goes. And this will bring all kinds of evil into your life. And so uh, if you're eating and the light goes out, which is often the case in Africa with the power outages, then it's best to stop eating and to wait until the light returns. Otherwise, uh, you're risking bringing evil into your life. In Rwanda, another um, nation in East Africa, uh, female virgins are forbidden from drinking Fanta soda, Fanta pop, you know, if you're familiar with that particular brand. Well, they're, they're, per, per, they're uh, forbidden from drinking orange Fanta pop. And uh, of course, orange is considered to be the only flavor of Fanta that is good for women and, and the particularly versions. So uh, unmarried girls who drink any other kind of Fanta are frowned upon and in some cases shunned. Okay, there's also in Rwanda, uh, the fact that women are discouraged from eating goat meat unless they grow beards. And so uh, there's another um, 
food, a, um, another food superstition, which, you know, of course, it's not a good thing to have whenever you're trying to uh, feed hungry people. Okay? Uh, also, uh, children should not be shown mirrors because if they're shown mirrors, then they will remember their past lives. So, you know, there are people who believe in re reincarnation. And, uh, and uh, if, if they're able to look into their souls in that way, then they could become entrapped in the mirrors. And so uh, that's a, uh, you know, rather than merely breaking the mirror, just uh, looking into the mirror for children becomes something they consider to be extremely dangerous. Okay. Uh, in Kenya, uh, some people believe that pythons bring rainfall. So if you see a, py a python, uh, that's a, a sign of uh, something that you would really want to embrace. In Nigeria, uh, many believe that pythons protect crops. So in that nation, uh, pythons are regarded as something that you want to that you want to bring uh, into your life, or, or or at least you don't look at it in a negative way. Uh, and in certain parts of Nigeria, people who kill pythons uh, must atone for doing so by giving a major funeral service in honor of that python's life. So they really take the uh, they take that very serious. Uh, in some African nations, uh, women are discouraged from uh, refilling their pregnancies until after the second trimester, uh, lest they uh, have evil spirits coming to their lives. And so um, uh, to find out, uh, well, if it's found out, uh, then the spirits will curse their pregnancy. Uh, finally, uh, some superstitions are, are rooted in truth. You know, for example, uh, we're talking about opening up an umbrella in a uh, house, you know, uh, well, if you open an umbrella in a house, you can put someone's eye out, you walk under a ladder, uh, you can have an accident or cause someone else to have an accident. But uh, what we're saying is that uh, although some of these superstitions might be rooted in truth, uh, they're still false and some of them are still extremely dangerous. And you can teach children to be safe without superstition. You can simply teach children don't open a, an umbrella in a house because you might put someone's eye out or you might uh, get hurt by traveling under a ladder. So we think uh, rather than trying to, uh, to uh, you know, dumb down our children, dumb down society, superstition is something we have to fight against. And uh, when I was in Ghana uh, in 1991, I was with the Rational Center and their model was down with superstition. And that's pretty much what we're saying today, down with superstition and up with rationality. Thank you. Well, thank you, Norm. And now I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Stuart Vise. Stuart is a behavioral scientist, teacher, and writer. He is a contributing editor for Skeptical Inquiry magazine, in which he writes the behavior and belief column, both online and in print. Stuart has written personal and professional essays in a variety of places, including The Observer, Medium, The Atlantic, The Good Men Project, Tablet, and Time. The first edition of his book, Believing in Magic, The Psychology of Superstition, won the William James Book Award for the American Psychological Association. The book has been translated into Japanese, German, and Romanian. His book, Going Broke, Why Americans Still Can't Hold On to Their Money, is an analysis of the current epidemic of personal debt. The first edition was translated into Chinese, and the second edition was released in September 2018 in both paperback and audiobook formats. In 2020, Stewart's book, Superstition, was published in the Oxford University Press. His latest book, The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational, was published in hardcover and audiobook on May 2nd, 2022. As an expert on superstition and irrational behavior, Stewart has been quoted in many news outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. He has appeared on CBS Sunday Morning, 
CNN International, the PBS NewsHour, and NPR's Science Friday. Stuart holds a PhD in psychology and both a BA and MA degree in English literature. He is a fellow of the Association of Psychological Science and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The majority of his teaching career was spent at Providence College, the University of Rhode Island, and Connecticut College. Welcome, Stuart Bies. Thank you so much, Margaret. What an introduction. I, I, I hope I can live up to it. Uh, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to this event. It's so wonderful. I've learned quite a bit already with the first two speakers, uh, and I love the international focus. I'm sorry to say that what I'm about to do will be fairly Eurocentric. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of a hodgepodge of different things. And, and there is a there is a little bit of the continuing self-promotion at the beginning. Uh, so here is close up a uh, cover of my first book, but revised in 2014, uh, The Psychology of Superstition. And I do like the fact that it has a black cat on the cover. And the more recent book on superstition is Superstition, a very short introduction released uh, two years ago. And it is in the Oxford University Press Very Short Introduction series. It's a really wonderful series of little pocketbooks. But uh, it was sort of a, an honor and a challenge to write this book because I'm a psychologist and I know a fair amount about the psychology of superstition. But this book covers the whole gamut, the history of it. And I'm going to share some of that with you today, as well as a, a little bit about the psychology of superstition. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't at least show you briefly my new book, which has just come out, as Margaret suggested. So what I plan to cover tonight is some history and background of superstition in the West, primarily, then a little bit of a quick run through my favorite superstitions. Uh, people like to talk about the various examples. Since it is Friday the 13th, I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on uh, where that came from and the controversy that surrounds it. If I get there, I'll finish up with a few words about the psychology, why people actually do believe in this stuff. First of all, one of the things I discovered in doing this work is that superstition is primarily a word, a label that is applied to various kinds of actions and beliefs. And it's not a positive label. And almost throughout its entire history, that has been true. Uh, it's been pointed in very different directions over the centuries. But except for a very brief moment in the fourth century BCE, it actually had a positive connotation. The, the Greek word desidaimonia meant that you were conscientiously religious, you did all the rituals and made the offerings to the gods that you were supposed to do and so forth. But very quickly, 100 years later, quick in the long run of things, it turned into being overly fearful of the gods. And of course, in Greek society, that was not something that was good. You're supposed to do things in moderation. The gods were not really supposed to be feared. And so it took its negative turn and it never changed that. From that point on, calling someone superstitious or a belief superstitious was a negative label. The Romans continued with the same ideas, both the overly fearful of the gods idea of superstition, and their word was superstitio, uh, which obviously is where our word comes from. But they also applied it, and this is true of the Greeks as well, they also applied it as a negative label towards sort of street level magic. Some of the things that we've been hearing about actually in the speech by Norm and others that the individual practitioners that would offer spells or magic or foretell the future. And it's interesting, by the way, in Norm's talk, he mentioned how quite obviously many of these magic men are poor right? And in fact, Plato did refer to the street level magicians as beggar priests. And it was not lost on them that these priests, and you would think that if they had the goods, that they'd be doing better for themselves. So continuing on, the sort of fast overview of the word and how it was used over the centuries is all on one page here. And we're going to dip back into some of this a bit later, but it was a good religion, then excessive religion in Greece and Rome, then bad religion in terms of these itinerant magicians, 
but also uh, in some cases later on, superstition was bad religion in the sense that non-Roman faiths, Jews and Christians were often called superstitious and were thought to be sort of sinister as a result. But you have to watch out what you say because what goes around may come around. And it turned out, of course, that the Roman Empire became Christian. And so suddenly, when it used to be okay to worship the Roman gods, now if anybody continued to worship the Roman gods, that was considered superstitious. The arrow of indictment went the other direction. And so bad religion was the label in the case of non-Christian religion. And finally, of course, the sky opens up, the sun comes pouring in, and the enlightenment happens. And suddenly now the label is not bad religion, but bad science. And that's sort of where we are today, that when we th call something superstitious, in most cases, it's a scientifically minded person talking about a non-scientific belief or action. And so that's kind of the fast overview of the word and how it's been used over time. It's kind of interesting. So before we leave the ancient world and old things, I wanted to spend a little bit of time with a favorite of mine, one of my favorite old uh, superstitions. And I like it in part because there's a lot to it. And also it's something we just really don't do in the West anymore. I could talk about some minor exceptions, but this is a curse tablet. It's made out of lead uh, and it was used by ancient Greeks and Romans. And the idea was that if you wanted to curse somebody, you may not have been literate. So you may have had to go to a vendor who would help you with this project. And they would have these flat pieces of lead and you would etch the curse, which could be a very complicated and long curse, naming names, who you want to be cursed and what you want to have happen to them. And then it would be rolled up into a tube and nails would be driven through it sort of ritualistically, not so much as a, as a voodoo doll thing, but probably there was an incantation done while they put nails through it. And then they would place it somewhere where it might get into the underworld, because the idea was that the curse is going to be carried out by demons or spirits in the underworld. And so often they were placed in graves or they were placed in wells because the wells were close to, of course, not a good thing to put a lead object into a well, but they didn't know that at the time. So, but anyway, there are quite a few of them. I think there's over a thousand of them that have been found all together all over uh, Europe. And they're called binding curses. They fall into a number of categories. For example, often in ancient Rome and Greece, you had to defend yourself in court if there was a dispute. And it was known that people who are very good orators would often win in court. And so if you were going up against somebody else in court, you might take out a curse against them so that they would be tongue tied on that day and you would have a better chance of winning. It's similar kinds of things for athletic competitions. You know, in the US, you could take out a curse against the New England Patriots or some other player. They often would take out curses against the opponent athlete that they wanted to lose. And there were love curses. There were situations where there might be a triangle, like you've fallen in love with a member of a couple that already exists. And so you would curse your rival to turn away and curse your intended to be only attracted to you and so forth. I don't know how well that worked out, but there are many of these kinds of curses in these categories. This is the last bit about this. I, I apologize for going on, but I really like this topic. In the baths in Bath, which actually are pre-Roman, but they were taken over by the Romans when the Romans took over southern England. The baths were a place where people would disrobe and go into the baths. And apparently, there was a phenomenon at this particular one where there must have been vendors with these curse tablets hanging around because, and it was sort of a great business model, because people would disrobe, they'd take off their jewelry, they'd leave it by the side, and then they'd take a bath and someone would steal their stuff, right? And so then the vendor would be right there and say, well, look, let's write out a curse and we can you know, at least make sure that something bad happens to that unknown person who stole your stuff. And so they found something like 130, most of them in the bath in the bottom actually, but they found 130 and most of them are of this kind. It's someone stole my stuff 
and I want these bad things to happen to them. Generally, these curse tablets drew the line at death. They did not wish for the death of the person, but some of the things they did wish were pretty gory and quite extensive. So it's a really interesting phenomenon. As a psychologist, I find it fascinating because if you think about the person coming out of the bath and being very frustrated, being able to fill out this curse tablet may have helped a little bit, went away feeling like, well, at least I got that guy. And so there may have been some psychological satisfaction in doing this act, even if, of course, it didn't have any impact at all. Then later on in Europe, we have the situation where superstition in the Christian world was defined as uh, continuing to worship the pagan gods. And you know, of course, like the beauty of Christianity is it provided a substitute for the pagan gods in the form of saints, which you were allowed to worship them, but also the street level magic. And, and there are quite a few things in, in Europe, augury uh, and other forms of divination. Augury is where you try to tell the fortune by the random flight of birds. Uh, and there were other similar kinds of things that involved random activities that you could sort of discern some meaning out of. There was a belief that there were weather magicians. So if your crops were spoiled by a big storm, you might believe that a tempestari, uh, someone who controls the weather had done it and be worried about that. There were curses. And eventually, of course, in Europe, we also had witchcraft. I'm very sorry to hear that it's still very much and very real in India and in Africa, as our previous speakers indicated. But uh, of course, it was a phenomenon in Europe in the Middle Ages as well. And this was obviously not an endorsed form of magic. They, and of course, it, it wasn't real at all to begin with. And there's this, a strong implication that it was used by the church as a boogeyman to sort of draw people to the church and away from and protect them from the alleged dangers of witchcraft. An interesting aspect of the Christian period in Europe was that the church didn't deny that these street level magicians actually had magic. They believed that they might be effective, which is kind of interesting. But what they said was that those street level people, they are using demons and we've got the good stuff. We have demon free magic in the church. We don't have the devil and so forth going on. So that's how they made their distinction. And apparently a lot of people bought that. But of course, the church did have its own magic. It didn't refer to it as magic. And many of the congregation would sort of ascribe magic to the priests and to the, the rituals of the church. And the church didn't sort of dissuade that. You know, they were benefiting from that belief. And so they sort of went along with it. They didn't, they didn't promote it, but they didn't uh, discourage it either. And so you have, for example, the baptism ritual is explicitly an exorcism ritual, driving away the devil. And people began to believe that holy water, consecrated salt, and the host had magical properties. And so people would steal them. People would take, they, sometimes they had to lock up the, the font where the holy water was and so on. And people would steal it. They put it on their houses or on their crops uh, because they believed there was magic to it. And again, the church benefited from those beliefs, obviously. And by the way, it's not over. If you want to get some holy water, it's Amazon. Last time I checked, it's only $8.98 for a little bottle of it. Uh, so religious magic is still here. Now, the, the church does not endorse this. I think this is a funny situation where the water is deemed to be holy simply because it's drawn from the, the River Jordan, if you believe the advertising. It's taken from the River Jordan. But obviously, people are ascribing magical beliefs to that. And this is one of my favorites, which I'm sure will be familiar to many people. Again, another religious magic thing that persists to this day. I think this kit will cost you something around 12 or 13 $13 on Amazon. And it's a nice little plastic St. Joseph who turns out to be an excellent realtor. If you are trying to get rid of your house, sell your house, now would be the time to do it. Prices are high. Then you just invest $12 in this kit and you bury him in the front yard. What I've heard is that the best way to do it is to bury him upside down somewhere under or near where the real estate sign is in the front yard. And boom, like that, your house will go at over the asking price, I'm sure. The Enlightenment superstition is now anti-science. And so we arrive at the situation, hopefully, where we are today. There is no agreed upon definition for what superstition is, but we all use the word. We kind of know what we mean. But I've tried to define it and with some controversy involved, but I describe it as a belief or practice that is not supported by science. 
I personally endorse making it culture fair, which means that if uh, the person has grown up in a society that ha has no exposure to, to the alternative, to Western science and to uh, an alternative viewpoint, a scientific viewpoint, then it probably wouldn't be productive to call them superstitious. I mean, I'm, I'm cognizant of the way the word has been used in the past as a negative label. And I think that there are probably other ways to, to work in those environments. But I would be interested to hear what other people on this call think about that. Uh, not everyone has agreed with me on that. Uh, and then, of course, it, it should be goal-directed. A superstition is trying to get uh, good luck or avoid bad luck. And so you get the little Venn diagram there with uh, paranormal beliefs in general being a larger category, but the pragmatic or goal-directed ones uh, are superstitions. And uh, our number 13 is in there, as it turns out. Okay, so... I mean, this is going to be familiar to many of you, so we'll go through this quickly, but I, I, I kind of like to, to touch on some of the, the beliefs that are out there. Um, and, and this being Friday the 13th, we should stop here at least briefly. Uh, and, 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 you know, how perfect are these results, right? This is a 2005 Gallup poll that said that 13% of respondents said they would be bothered if they were placed on the 13th floor in a hotel. Uh, and something like 9% would be bothered enough that they would ask uh, for a different room. It's perfect, perfect finding. Uh, and I think I actually saw a recent, a very recent uh, YouGov poll that, that came up with a very similar result. So, so uh, people are, don't want to be on the 13th floor. I believe, uh, you know, that this is really just a straight business decision. Uh, it's much easier, uh, you know, for, to, to just pretend that there is no 13th floor. And then when you try to sell a hotel room or, a, or rent an office space, uh, it'll just be easier. And we all know that we all are in on the joke. But uh, uh, interestingly, uh, I understand that in Moscow, uh, they take a completely different approach. They, they believe that uh, it, it would be silly not to have a 13th floor, but they offer a discount for, for uh, apartments in, on the 13th floor. So, you know, they're still, they're still um, doing something with respect to it. I've written a fair amount about actually a two-part series in Skeptical Inquirer about um, uh, real estate and superstition. And there's a lot to be said about superstition in the, in the, in, uh, the marketplace, in commerce. Uh, I th unfortunately, I think this is how it is sustained uh, quite a bit because it has financial implications. Uh, and so, you know, you do have feng shui uh, is, a, is a very popular thing, obviously, in the East, but, uh, but in the United States as well. There are, there are many feng shui consultants who will come out and tell you whether this house has good feng shui or not and whether you should buy it. And if it doesn't, there are different things that you can do to sort of make an adjustment. One of them is that you can put these, these little feng shui coins uh, in certain corners of your house and somehow the, the, the waves will be better that way and so forth. Red is a lucky color in the Asian world. And so uh, the red string is, is appropriate. I have, a, I have a personal interest in the evil eye. I understand that somebody has published like an, an 11 volume book on the evil eye, which I have, I have not read, but, uh, but the evil eye is a very complicated and widespread uh, uh, superstition, which I, I, it fascinates me because it is so widespread and because it takes different forms in different cultures. Um, the, uh, you have in this slide, you have the Hamsa with the eye in it, uh, or sometimes called a hand of Fatima, very common in the Middle East, and it's made into jewelry uh, and, uh, and so on. And then the, the, you have the, the Turkish Nazar is the blue thing on the left. And the horn is an Italian, um, a, Italian thing that is supposed to distract the evil eye. The superstition, if you're not familiar with it, is, is an envy-based uh, thing where you have something of great value. Often it's a baby, a new baby. Uh, you have something of great value and you worry that someone who is envious of you will bring harm to that baby or to you personally uh, out of envy. And, and these people are thought to have the evil eye, which means that they can do this harm merely by looking, which would be a really cool thing if you could do it. Uh, but... Uh, but the jewelry uh, and these objects are meant to be a distraction for the eye. The eye would go to the jewelry 
rather than to the object of uh, that you're worried about. Uh, and in some cases, the idea is that the evil eye will be reflected back at the sender, which would be a good defense. Uh, there, it, it's fascinating the way it's done differently in different cultures. For example, in, in Italy, where they call it malocchio, uh, that if you think that you're sick, for some people do this little ritual where if you think that you're sick and that the sickness was brought on by the evil eye, then you take a little bowl of water and you drop some at, at you know, olive oil, of course, on the surface. And if the olive oil appears in blobs, in, in you know, drops uh, on the surface of the water, then you're good. It wasn't the evil eye. But if it, if it appears runny, on the surface of the water, if I, I think I've got that right, uh, then too bad you 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 had the evil eye, and uh, so it, it it it's done differently. There are different kinds of fuel, jewelry. This too, I think, has become a business item, and so I mean, I see the Turkish Nazars everywhere, uh, and it's and uh, I, I think Meghan Markle has been seen wearing uh, the Turkish Nazar jewelry, and you know, it's it's there's a there is a profit motive there. And so is it there one here? Um, uh, these are two, obviously, two popular, uh, you know, systems of superstition. I, I don't think that anybody on this call will dispute that. Uh, astrology is a huge business, and uh, Babu suggests uh, that an extremely lucrative one in, in India. Uh, and, of course, homeopathy uh, is a is a uh, a false medicine that is everywhere and has become very popular. The, the British royal family seems to be very uh, enamored of it, uh, Prince Charles and, and others. Uh, so now the, I, just quickly, a couple of examples of a different kind of superstition. Obviously, uh, we all have heard about many of these ones I've talked about before. They're socially shared, they're cultural in their nature. But uh, also, of course, we haven't really mentioned the fact that people have personal superstitions that they establish uh, on their own by trial and error uh, and, uh, or, or some, some idea that comes to them. And so here are three famous examples. Uh, Taylor Swift was born on December 13th. I don't know whether that was a Friday, but the, it would have been a Friday you know, at some point uh, and on her birthday. Uh, but she actually thinks of 13 as her lucky number. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that it's a lucky number for her either. But at the same time, I kind of think she's doing a good thing by demystifying the, the number 13 and, and talking about it as being lucky for her. You may recognize the basketball player on the right is, uh, is a, a former president of the United States, Barack Obama. And he, he had a superstition, which he writes about in the first volume of his autobiography, uh, in which he believed that he needed to play basketball on election day for good luck. And, uh, and the superstition he explains started when uh, the very first uh, primary contest that he had was in 2008 for the, uh, the Iowa caucus. And he, for whatever reason, he used to play basketball with his, his staff often on the, on the campaign trail. He organized a game on the day of the caucus and he won the Iowa caucus. The next contest in the series was the New Hampshire primary. And for whatever reason, he did not organize a game on that day and Hillary Clinton beat him. So from that point on, it was locked in and he and on both general election days, he's had a very celebrated basketball game. He had a very celebrated basketball game and and rumor has it that he, his team won both times as well as the election, of course. And of course, that's Rafael Nadal, the, the uh, very talented tennis player who claims he's not superstitious. He claims that all the things he does are not superstitions. I, I think he would probably describe them as rituals or something. Uh, but he goes on and on and on. He, he actually delays the play of game and sometimes and gets a warning. Um, he, these are Here he's adjusting two water bottles in, in exactly the right way that he wants them. And I am told that one of the water bottles has cold water in it and the other one has warm water in it. And he does this long thing of pulling out his jersey and all this kind of stuff uh, before he plays. So that's a very typical thing that athletes do. Athletes are often very superstitious and wanting to eke out a bit of extra luck. On the weird end of the spectrum, we have Heidi Klum and her baby teeth. 
so Heidi Klum is a, uh, used to be sort of a supermodel at, um, model, I guess, and uh, and she believed that she she collected her actual baby teeth in a little leather pouch, which she kept with her at all times. She actually told in this YouTube video that I got this from, she told about how at one time she dropped the pouch on an airplane and all the teeth came out on the front floor. But she she believes that these baby teeth are lucky for her, so she keeps them with her. Uh, that's that's one, on the weird end of the uh, personal superstitions. So So now let's come back to where we are today and uh, talk about the Friday the 13th. It is Friday the 13th. Uh, and uh, I, I want to just point out that, that if, if you're interested in the history of the number 13 and all the superstitions associated with it and, uh, and, and the, the controversy about what the origin of Friday the 13th is, I really recommend this book by Nathaniel Lockemeyer. I believe he he nailed it. He did all the research. It's a very thoroughly researched book, and there's some great stuff in it. Uh, and and so what I'm about to tell you comes largely from what I uh, have gotten from him. But there are three competing theories, and I used to talk about this. You know, I've been talking about superstition for quite some time, and I would mention the one that I thought was the the right theory. And I would get angry emails from people who were supporters of one of the other two. Uh, so I just want to say from the beginning, uh, don't trust me, go to the book. And I, I think that he has a convincing argument. So here are the three theories. Theory number one, which is not right in, in my and, and Lockenmeyer's view, uh, is that it is true that on Friday, October 13, 1307, I've never really checked to make sure that that was a Friday, but I trust that it was, uh, a large number of the Knights Templar were arrested. So the Knights Templar were a crusading group of knights, uh, and they became quite wealthy uh, doing what they what what crusaders will do. Uh, and uh, and but and and they got involved in a controversy. I believe that basically the the motive for arresting them was to get some of their money, and uh, and they uh, ultimately a group of them, including the their leader, was burned at the stake. Burning at the stake was really popular back in those days. And uh, you know, I of all the ways to go, I don't want to do that one. But uh, but so this was thought to be, but is is thought to be by some people the origin. It's the only of the theories that actually puts Friday and 13 together right at the beginning, right away. Uh, so, but, but uh, Lockenmeyer says, no, not so. So here's number two. Uh, and this is from Norse mythology. And some of you may know this story, but uh, according to legend, uh, there was uh, a 12 benevolent gods in Valhalla partying it up, having a good time. Uh, including Balder, who was believed to be a, a benevolent, a much loved god. Uh, and then the mischievous and evil Loki joined the group, making it 13 people, and he instigated the death of Balder. He, he, the, what ensued uh, produced the death of Balder. And so this, this is another, as you'll see, this is one of two examples in which there are 13 people in a group and that is considered to be unlucky. But Lockenmeyer says, no, that's not the right one. Uh, this one is, is the winner. Uh, theory number three, which is the Last Supper, also a group of 13 people at a table uh, specifically, and, uh, and Judas betrayed Jesus, uh, and of course the crucifixion happened and so forth. And, it, and there is evidence that Lockemeyer finds in documents uh, of over several centuries, this belief that 13 people at a table, uh, a group of 13 people was unlucky, uh, is referred to over and over again in documents. And so it wasn't until quite late, late 18th century that, that 13 just got to be a free floating number. And it got out of the table, got up from the table, and, uh, and then at that point, it could be associated with just about anything. And, and Fridays were um, thought to be unlucky uh, because they were hangman's day. And, uh, and, uh, and it was thought to be unlucky to start a new venture or go on a journey starting on a Friday. So when you finally ended up with a Friday that was the 13th, then you got a double dose of, of bad luck. It's interesting that there was a famous 13 society 
13 Club. And this business about the Friday, they actually were, they're very, uh, you know, sort of enlightened group. Uh, and they, uh, with, with chapters in several cities in the U.S., and they actually advocated for the two-day weekend, in part so that Friday would not be thought of as a bad day anymore. We do think of Friday as a good day uh, uh, today, but, they, but they, were, they were actually politically advocating for the, for the two-day weekend on that basis. Um, okay, so... Uh, I, I'm going to end now soon, uh, but I will say a few words about why people do believe this since I am a psychologist. Uh, obviously, you don't, you're not born superstitious. Somebody has to teach you. Uh, you are socialized just as with religion and anything else. You are socialized typically by your family but, or, or someone important around you as you're young. And, uh, and, and if that's the case, then, then that will make superstition a possibility for you. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't be uh, for those of us who didn't grow up that way. Uh, it's clear that if you are superstitious uh, and, you, and you engage in these actions, uh, in many cases, especially the positive superstitions, it's a way of coping with anxiety. You know, we, we, you, if you're an athlete and you really want to perform well, there comes a time where you're just waiting to go out on the field and you can't really practice and you can't do anything else. And so performing some kind of a ritual or superstition undoubtedly reduces your anxiety. Whether it actually affects your play or not is a much more controversial question. And there's been some research with unfortunately mixed results on that. Uh, and also it, you do get a, this, psychologists talk about this thing called the illusion of control, that even when you don't have control, if you take some action towards the goal that you're hoping for, you get this feeling like you've done something better and, or something more. And that feeling is positive enough to, to sustain the behavior, to, to do it. I mean, it's obvious that for people who are superstitious in the moment, as they're doing it, they do feel better. Uh, you know, there probably are, and I think many of us would agree, other ways to cope with that. And, and we've all found them. But uh, nonetheless, that's how it functions uh, for people. And I, I just want to come back to this point again, because I think it's really important and it's often overlooked, which is that there is a profit motive uh, that does sustain superstitions often. Uh, you know, it, it would be against someone's business interest to come out to, to reject astrology and, and drop their business, sell their business and stop doing astrology. They, they would lose a lot of money. Evil eye jewelry, uh, these are just a few examples. It's also the case that uh, you may know that, that in, the, in the Asian world, the number four is bad luck and the number eight is good luck. So it turns out that in the random marketplace, you almost never see a four, but you see a lot of eights. This is, a, this is like a fusion restaurant in somewhere in New Jersey, according to the 609 area code. And, and for an Asian person dialing that number, to order food, those eights would mean something to them and would be a connection. And so, so people, people fight for those phone numbers, believe it or not. They pay money to get those phone numbers because they, because they benefit their business. And obviously things like homeopathy too. So, so it's not just that we're fighting against you know, reason versus superstition, we're also fighting against the marketplace and, and the idea that in a free market, where there are no controls and anybody can sell anything they want to, uh, we're, we're up against that profit motive as well in terms of trying to stop it or, or get rid of it. Uh, one sort of final thought about superstition that I think is interesting as a psychologist is that people fall into different categories. There are true believers who just believe it's true and look, I'm going to do this and this has worked for me my whole life and you, know, you can't tell me otherwise. But there are awful lot of people who are sort of somewhere in the in the middle. They are they are uh, you know like I know this is silly, but I'm just going to feel better if I do this, right? I just you know maybe they grew up superstitious. Uh, I remember back in the days of chain letters, people would talk this way. I know this is silly, but I'm going to copy this chain letter and send it off because I'll just feel better. They often threatened big, bad things if you didn't do it. So. So, uh, you know, this is very consistent with a sort of modern view of cognition that, that, that we, are, we have this, that, that Daniel Kahneman talked about in this best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is that we have a, a, a quick acting sort of intuitive cognitive system that works in parallel with our more 
computational, slow acting, but smarter, uh, more rational system. And so the two can be in conflict in this situation. I think it's true that people, some people have this intuitive, emotional feeling that I'm just going to feel better if I do this superstition, even though I know it's silly. And what I would say personally, and this is just my viewpoint, I'm not too worried about those people. I, I, they at least have the consciousness that they are doing something that doesn't make sense. And when push comes to shove, I think they're going to go to their doctor, they're going to get vaccinated, they're going to do the things that they need to do. Uh, because they do have the equipment. It's just in conflict with their upbringing, perhaps, and so forth. So, uh, so uh, I have sort of put it into three categories. And, you know, you have the skeptics for whom superstition would never be an option. And, and there are probably a couple on this call. Uh, you have the conflicted people who, you know, I just would feel better. And you have the true believers. I, I think that the ones that we have to worry about are the true believers, the ones who, the ones who really are not accepting of the alternative viewpoint and, uh, and so on. And so, uh, so on that cheerful note, I will end and just say thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be here. Stuart, that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And just so you know, at the Frigatriska Decaphobia Treatment Center, we spell astrology with two S's. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> now, before we take a quick break and come back for the question and answer section of this seminar, I remind the audience that the Free Thought Society depends on donations to continue to offer educational programs and speakers who enlighten and motivate, like the three you heard tonight. Please see the chat section of the Zoom for a direct link to the Free Thought Society's donation page. And remember that in honor of today's event, donating $13 or $31 would be very special indeed. Actually, any donation would be appreciated. If you are leaving the room to refresh, please turn up the volume of your device to enjoy the break music we're providing done by my friend, James Clue. He is singing Ain't That Magic, a song he wrote to poke fun at superstitions. And while you enjoy the song, if you're still at front of your computer, we will show you photos from past Frigatriska Decaphobia Treatment Center, Friday the 13th, anti-superstition events. So we're gonna see you in about four minutes. I'm talking about superstition. What's all the who with that superstition? Won't you tell me, dear superstition? Are you serious? Superstition, or just a little risk? Come on, what happened when you learn it ain't that magic? Black cat, third. Not the lattice, mac, crack, key, ring, ring wishbone, rabbit, egg, mirror, break, triple, six, circle, salt, toss, wood, not mine, no, everybody tell me it's the way old, what happens when you learn it ain't that magic, no, superstition, what's all the hooey there, superstition, won't you tell me dear superstition, I'm your serious superstition, or just delirious, now come on, what happens when you learn it ain't that magic? Oh, trick, treat, bless you, have them gram umbrella on the inside, blow the rollers, cross them a digit, sign the way the devil took your mind. No, everybody tell me it's the way old. What happens when you learn it ain't that magic? Oh. Let the children play, lead them to the shrine, that's fine If you tell them that's what we did back then, I'm go 
all your planets in line now I said to go on going to go ahead and uh, start with some of the questions that are in the chat already. So Tara's got a question. How are we going to get through to people from various cultures and religions if they feel we disrespect and look down upon them and their beliefs, which I fear is probably happening in some cases? It's a delicate type rope one has to walk when trying to educate people of cherished long-held beliefs. If they sense that we feel they are somehow ignorant, there may be more pushback. And I'm not sure, maybe Stuart, if you want to take that question. Well, I, I would. I'd also like to hear what Norm has to say about it. But I'm, I, I think it's a, a very important question. There's been a lot written lately about humility in skepticism. And I sort of think that that's an important thing to do to, to sort of meet people at where they, where they are. I think, I think it also is important that to support humanists wherever they are so that others don't come in from the outside, but instead you're supporting the humanist activities or the, the anti-superstition activities uh, where they are. And I think, you know, local people are going to be much more effective than, than others uh, in, in, in making the case. Uh, but th those are my initial thoughts about that. And Norm, would you like to add in? I, I agree with Stuart. Uh, I believe that the best way to do it is with grassroots activism. And that's, it's not only with superstition, but it's with anything. I spoke on this program a few months ago, and I was talking about how in Africa, when they were fighting against female genital mutilation, it wasn't that they depended upon people from the West to come over there and try to educate them. They had their own grassroots organizations in 25 different African nations. And we have the same type of thing among skeptics, free thinkers, atheists, and humanists in Africa. They have their own organizations. Uh, when I was uh, involved with organized humanism, I was able to travel to many African nations. And even those I didn't travel to, I was able to establish relationships with people. And uh, we were able to establish or strengthen over 70 different groups in Africa and about 30 African nations. And uh, these people were doing their own stuff. You know, we would send them uh, books, we would send them newsletters, we would send them magazines and other reading materials, we would send them funding. But they were the ones primarily responsible for taking their information to the masses in their own way. So that's the best way to do it. Allow the grassroots organizations to thrive. They're there already. All we have to do is help encourage them. Excellent. Randy had a question in the chat. Where did the superstition that a black cat crossing your path is bad luck coming from? Where did that come from? What I have heard is that uh, black cats are, I mean, actually black cats have different, uh, oh, look at Margaret has their props. And so they, does Laura, they, she's got one up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> black cats are uh, ha have been associated with with witches in in Europe, and there was a belief that witches could transform into black cats, and therefore a black cat might be a witch. Uh, but there are some there are some contexts uh, even in Europe, I believe, where black cats are actually good luck. So it's a it's a it's a variegated thing. But th but the origin of that, from what I understand, is is the association of black cats with witchcraft. Excellent. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I just want to say um, that at one of our anti-superstition parties in Fullerton, California, we brought in the SPCA with crates of black cats so that they could be adopted that night. 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, Lauren, you've had your hand up and go ahead and please ask your question with your black cat in hand. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so essentially Tara pretty much covered my question. Um, I find it's hard even when talking about when I heard about the burying of St. Joseph in the yard and what my family called Malooks doing the oil and water. I was raised Catholic. I, you know, I'm not Catholic anymore. So from my perspective, it's really easy for me to kind of criticize certain things because I lived it. I, I'm familiar with it. Um, but then when looking upon other people, other cultures, other countries, how to not perpetuate racism and xenophobia when talking about um, superstition or um, certain practices, um, because I find it's really easy to, to take your own roots and upbringing and to kind of try and dismantle some of those things, but it's a lot harder to um, criticize and combat certain other things because it, 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 it does end up feeling a little bit racist and a little bit xenophobic. I don't know if that's necessarily a question, but it, it's more of a comment and it's something that I struggle with because I don't, I'm not anti anything because of the color of someone's skin, because of their religion necessarily, um, but why we're here, you know, it, it still um, doesn't make sense in, in terms of superstition. I think that's a very thoughtful um, comment and uh, perhaps question. And would any of our speakers like to address that? I, I believe that you do have to be uh, consistent. I believe that whenever you're you're trying to promote your particular worldview, you always have to be respectful of other cultures. At the same time, though, you can't really buy into cultural relativism. Uh, and so often that's a problem. Uh, a lot of people believe that this is our culture and they feel personally attacked when you're dealing with criticisms regarding their culture or their traditions. So we do have to tread lightly, you know, uh, we do have to respect the people, we have to respect their history, uh, we have to respect their contributions. And that's always uh, foremost in, in my way of thinking. But at the same time, I don't believe that we have to uh, pretend that uh, these superstitions aren't dangerous. When I was in Ghana back in 1991, I was speaking at the W.E.B. Du Bois Memorial Center for Pan-African Culture. And uh, someone uh, from the United States said that when you come to Africa, you have to, uh, you have to respect their beliefs. You know? And uh, one of our Ghanaian uh, humanist friends uh, wasn't exactly sure what he meant by that. You know? And uh, my point is that, yes, we have to respect first and foremost people's rights to their beliefs. Uh, but to say that we have to be so respectful that we can't be critical of those beliefs is a mistake. I mean, I criticize my beliefs, you know, I criticize our beliefs. And that's where it begins with, you know, you have to understand that superstition, as Stuart and Babu have pointed out, is it's a worldwide problem, you know, but uh, I don't think that uh, we, we do ourselves any favor by trying to go overboard with the respect to the point where we can't offer criticisms. But one of my favorite quotations is that in every, every country ridicules every other and all are right. We all have our share of ridiculous superstitions. And I think if we can agree upon that, then we should all be free to criticize not only our own superstitions, but wherever they come from, but to do so uh, respectfully and to do so without uh, being racist or xenophobic. I, I appreciate everyone's answer. I appreciate your answer. And I think it was very, I think one of the things that came to mind when, when you were talking, Mr. Allen, was the first thing that came to mind was female genital mutilation. And I think it's really telling. That was one of the things that you, you know, introduced into the discussion because it, it, it is a very fine line. But I, I definitely heard what you said. And I think you're spot on and I, I appreciate your clarification. Right. A female genital mutilation really isn't superstition per se. Right. Uh, it exactly. Is, it, right. It is a problem as far as uh, people who buy into it, be they men or women, who don't believe that uh, you have a right to criticize their culture. 
which right. is why I was saying that there were women who started their feed anti-FGM programs in Africa, right. and that's the best way to do it, as opposed to someone from outside of the continent trying to impose their views upon them. Yes, thank you. That's excellent. Um, anyone else? Yeah, I'm thinking that um, when we poke fun at a superstition, we are actually beginning to ask people to think critically, to examine uh, just, you know, a little bit. It's, it's not, you know, throwing a, a lot of stuff at them. And that's why we pose our uh, poking fun at uh, these superstition in a fun way. And people, you know, leave the event thinking, oh, I didn't know about that. And boy, you know, I say that habitually. Um, why do I say that? I'll stop saying that because it doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we, um, we are, are teaching critical thinking skills in a fun way. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I just had a neighbor. She was very much into astrology and numerology. I think I put in the thing. She, I was living in the apartment at uh, 205. She said, you add up the numerals, it's a seven. So as so long as I live where I live, I'll be alone almost all the time. And, and she called it like this was called this esoteric. And that was a different kind of meaning to esoteric than I'd known before. I, you know what this term esoteric means when it's used that way? I'll, t I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I think it. I think it just is a, a word like esoterica, meaning you know mysterious and rare. Uh, I think it's just a descriptor that they're probably using to add a little bit of uh, flash to to this group of beliefs. But I, I'm that's a, just a guess on my part. I've not heard this term used that way before. Yeah, I agree with Stuart. And um, you were talking about numerology. Uh, numerology has been a big problem among many African Americans. For example, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, if you remember uh, back in 1995 when he had his march on Washington, he was drawing upon numerology to try to explain uh, where Black people are, uh, how we got to this point, stuff like that. And so often they refer to it as mathematics, but it's not mathematics. Numerology is not mathematics. It's, it's basically pseudoscience. And uh, so often they use terms like uh, like esoteric, and, and they, they use that term in order to come off as though they have some deep understanding of how numbers work. But, but numerology doesn't really deal with math at all, whether you're talking about arithmetic or, or uh, calculus or any other uh, branch of mathematics. And, and numerology and astrology do something very, very dangerous to people. They make people rely on uh, unscientific ways of making decisions and, and making plans. I think that it's people need to be taught um, co confidence. They need to, to understand that they can make decisions based on probabilities and, and facts and circumstances. The easy way to make a decision is to look at your horoscope or go to some soothsayer who's you know, trying to tell you what your future is or what your decision should be based on numerology. I have a family member who used numerology a lot, and I was shocked when she told me, one, how much she paid for the service, but two, that she was making very uh, hard life decisions based on numerology. And then... 10 years into her numerology uh, consult, uh, consulting, she found out she had a different birth date than what she gave the numerologist. And then she said, well, that explains everything. That's why my life has gone to shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, never mind. <laughs> but again, you know, I, I, try to, I try to talk to people about using their common sense, using their rational thinking, critical thinking skills, um, analyzing their situation, looking at probabilities, all of those things can help you be a better decision maker, not a trip to a palmist or a numer numerologist or astrologer. Well, I'd like to know more about uh, homeopathy. I know a little bit about it. I get a shop at this um, health food store where the, one of the owners was a homeopathist. And he charged $200 an hour to give homeopathy advice. I know they take substance and then they do something, they remove things for it. It's supposed to have some sort of um, like energy or something. And 
I don't know a lot about it. They ask you questions like, do you like uh, being uh, thunderstorms to figure it out? I don't really, I know a lot about it, but I'd be interested in finding out. So, uh, so homeopathy is a, is a form of medicine that developed in the uh, early 1800s by a guy named Samuel Hahnemann, a German physician. And it's based on two very simple principles, uh, which in combination make it sort of a meaningless medicine. Uh, the first one is not so crazy. It is that, that a substance that creates the same symptoms, if you take it uh, in a healthy person, as what you're trying to cure uh, is is a good medicine, uh, and and you know this this isn't doesn't seem completely crazy to me, but but the next principle does make it crazy, which is that they believe that the more diluted the substance is, the more effective it is. So the medicines that are offered and that have been offered over the years for homeopathy are extremely diluted. And in fact, there's some question as to whether they have the original substance in them at all, which is in some cases good because some of the original medicines are poisons. The uh, deadly nightshade is one of the, is a homeopathic uh, medicine, but thankfully when you buy it in the store, it's so diluted that it can't affect you. Uh, but they're basically expensive bottles of placebo. And, uh, and the Center for Inquiry has a suit against uh, CVS and Walgreens, and I think also Walmart now, in which they're trying to get them to label them differently because they're placed right next to actual FDA approved medicines in the CVS and sold, you know, they're, they're sort of riding on 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 the way in which they're presented and and people use them a lot and some people buy them knowingly but uh but they should be labeled as something other than real medicine i see that babu has been able to join us and i don't have any idea oh. what time it is where you are but welcome thanks for your uh, terrific presentation D did you have anything you'd like to add yeah i i just wanted to pitch in uh with what was asked earlier this question about politeness there are two components to this, I think. There is one, the, the education that we need to offer, the information we need to share. And you can't share education or information or educate people by scolding them. Obviously, one wants to connect with those people. But on the other hand, are people who are exploiting these beliefs. We have to debunk them, we have to attack them, we have to expose them. And there I can't see any discussion possible about politeness and courtesy and so on. One is crime and deception, the other is education. Um, I, I think we have to keep that distinction clear. And just like human rights work, I believe our work is human rights work. It is dirty, it is ugly, and not always about public relations. It needs to be said because it needs to be said. I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, great point. This reminds me so much of what we're going through today in the, in the area of misinformation. Uh, and, and then that gets us into conspiracies and all of this. It's sort of all related, and it's interesting in terms of how we approach all of it and, and deal with all of it. While, uh, Norm, while you were talking, I started thinking about an acquaintance of mine in uh, Nigeria. No advanced education, but on his own, thought through the Bible and just realized the absurdity, and on his own became an atheist without any, without, and he didn't dare talk to anybody. And I'm just thinking, what kind of <sighs> intelligence, free thinking would it take for someone on their own in Nigeria, in that atmosphere, to to make that ama amazing step. Well, it, it really doesn't have a lot to do with the intelligence as far as making that step, but it does take courage in certain parts, especially if you happen to live in predominantly Muslim uh, uh, area in in uh, say northern Nigeria, where people are constantly being subjected to Sharia law. But if you um, but as far as someone just thinking critically, uh, I, I don't think you really have to have a lot of education to learn how to think critically. But if you have education, you can learn the various terms used uh, as far as, you know, formal logic and what have you. But as far as thinking, uh, 
I think anyone can do it. You know, in fact, I know plenty of uneducated people who are atheists who have just mm -hmm. simply seen through through the problems. They've seen the contradictions, the inconsistencies, the absurdities, the atrocities, and other problems with the Bible, and, and have just moved past that. So uh, I don't think that you necessarily need uh, education. Uh, back when I was first uh, growing out of religion, uh, I was doing it on my own, and this was before the rise of the internet. I had to go to uh, bookstores, and you know, I had to order books by mail, and uh, you know, just uh, you know, I, or I would have courses in college on uh, philosophy of religion and, and other topics, and uh, just you know, you, you look at this stuff and uh, you understand what's been done to you. That you know, in a very real sense, you have been brainwashed, and uh, a lot of people have their doubts. Uh, but they just don't express those doubts out of fear. You know, and if you don't have to deal with the fear, then it's easier to express those doubts and hopefully to find a sense of community to help people, you know, to, to come together with other people to help you even grow more intellectually. Well, I always thought he was a pretty amazing person to have accomplished that. Right, right. Uh, but I don't, I don't really think... Uh, that you necessarily have to uh, have the education. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, there are a lot of highly educated people who really don't think critically <laughs> about the religion. So, you know, it, you know, in that case, they're using their intelligence to further their own ignorance or to just rationalize yeah. what they already believe. You have to use mm -hmm. your intelligence in a very smart way. You know, you, you can't just use it to to try to defend your own deeply cherished worldview. But uh, if you know how to think critically and to think outside the box, I think you'll be okay, whether you're highly educated or not. So it took courage mainly. Right, it takes courage and it takes the uh, desire to, to think outside the box, mm -hmm. you know. We also need to be there for them. We need right. to be out uh, mm -hmm. on the internet. We need to be presenting, you know, things that make people think. If we're right. silent, then we're not we're not doing any good okay. so build it and they will come <laughs> you know well he he actually reached out to us through the internet well i'm in calgary alberta and we have a support group he reached out to the support group it was the first group he found that was supporting atheists and we were able to get him in touch with leo igwe right. to find people closer to home and by the way there's this uh, organization called Humanist Global Charities that's doing a lot of work in Africa uh, and India uh, in particular, and they've got schools going and, and, and some terrific projects. Encourage everybody to check them out and support them. They've got over 300 projects uh, going on globally, but particularly in, in, in those areas, and they're just awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm also still um, interested in, in Norm's um, thoughts on the situation with uh, Mubarak Bala in Nigeria. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that I, I feel a kinship to this gentleman. Um, I'm trained as a chemical engineer. He's trained as a chemical engineer. I'm president of the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara. He's president of the Humanist Society of Nigeria or association mm -hmm. and has been in prison for two years and was just recently sentenced to 24 years um, in prison for making a Facebook post that uh, appeared to be critical of Prophet Muhammad. So um, I find this kind of devastating. And Norm, I don't know if you mentioned, you know, Leo uh, Igwe and any, any comments or thoughts that you want to share about this uh, situation? Yes, it's been very, very depressing and it's gone on for far too long. Uh, but I do think Leo has not only done a good job over there, but he's also done a good job of getting other people throughout the world to call attention to it. But it, it's really difficult because uh, when you look at northern Nigeria, uh, they pretty much uh, run a, you know, according to their own their own uh, laws. And uh, you know, as Leo and other Nigerians have pointed out, in theory, Nigeria is supposed to be a secular nation. But you have all these various Sharia states, and it's particularly in northern Nigeria, where uh, they can do what they want to do, and uh, it's just just so difficult. It would be nice if the uh, if the national government would would become involved, but it is a very complicated situation, and they don't. 
I guess all we can really do though is continue to put pressure, to continue to write letters, to continue to support Neo and all these other organizations who are trying to, to, to bring an end to this. I, I hope it ends soon. So I said it's going on for far too long, but it's very frustrating. Agreed. Yeah, Humanist International, I think, has some funds set up to support the legal processes for, uh, for Bala. Questions there or comments that anybody has to make? Stuart, I have one. I happen to uh, know some Mandarin. And so on the issue of the four uh, yeah. in Mandarin, uh, the, my understanding is, is that uh, uh, the number four is su, and Mandarin has four tones. And if you say it one way, it's the number four. And if you say it another way, it means death. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, and so it's both, that, it's both that of them connotation. Are, yeah. That, that exactly. gives it that, and, a negative. Yes. And both of them are, have this sort of random association with another, you know, the sound of another word. Yes. And it, it, the, the word, the word for eight also sounds like something word for prosperity or something. I can't, oh, I don't know exactly right, the right. translation, but, but I actually, I was on a call, a podcast uh, with actually with a bunch of kids yeah. and, and of course I couldn't see them. And, uh, and there was a teacher on the call and I mentioned this thing about sounding like it. And the teacher asked the Chinese student to say the words and, and, and confirmed yeah. live on the call that the two, that the two numbers do sound like these words and that mm -hmm. that's the origin of it. So right. yes, yeah, just one of those random things, you know, yeah. that uh, they, they can't separate out the number from the, the word. Excellent. Any other uh, comment or question? Well, Margaret, I think Not I'll turn yet. it over to you. All right. Well, thanks for running the question and answer session, Dave. You did a great job. And uh, we also thank you for being a co-host and an excellent Zoom technician. I also want to thank Judy for co-hosting at the last moment and working with us. And, and I want to take this opportunity to once again thank our speakers, Babu Goganini, Norm Allen, and Stuart Vise. And kudos to all of you. Uh, the Free Thought Society enjoys bringing you Zoom presentations, and we hope you will support future events by donating to the Free Thought Society. For those who would like to socialize, we now welcome you to the Free Thought Society's late night Frigatriscophobia Treatment Center Happy Hour. And those of you who are leaving now, good night, and thank you so much for attending. For those of you staying with us, uh, let's kick off the Frigatriscodecophobia Treatment Center happy hour with a toast. <laughs> All right. Okay, with this toast, ching ching. From this day forward, all attendees will be absolved of all past superstitions to begin a new uh -huh. mental state of skeptical reasoning and rational thought processes. May you always take responsibility for shaping your own future, rely on intelligence and the scientific method of decision-making, have no fear of Friday the 13th and question all habitual responses to superstitions. Cheers, everyone. Here, here. Here. So let's have some self introductions for those of you who are staying for the social hour. Stuart, you're, you're still with us. Yay! I raise yeah, my glass I, to you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I may not last long. I've been going at this since eight o'clock this morning. Uh, oh, so, so, uh, so anyway, but what a pleasure to be here and what a wonderful uh, event. And uh, thank you so much. It was nice to meet you all. And, uh, you know, shall, shall we triumph, uh, please, uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> right. And Babu, thank you for hanging in with thank us. You. What time is it in your zone? Oh, it's it's pretty all right. It's uh, half past eleven in uh, daytime, so we are good. Oh, We're good. wonderful! Yes. And it's, it's tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We, we have crossed the crisis of Friday the thirteenth. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can tell you, Australia is a very very 
reasonable place to be in. There's not too much superstition. Astrologers have to declare that it is for entertainment only. And frequently astrologers are arrested. So, wow. And, and the government does not approve of homeopathic treatment. So this is Friday the 13th country without any trouble. Well, I know uh, Richard Saunders in um, Australia who was successful in stopping the selling of balance uh, bracelets where they were claiming that they had all kinds of powers, um, especially for the sports people. And, um, you know, it got out of hand. They were claiming all kinds of things that this bracelet would cure. And he was very successful in stopping those claims as well as shutting down the business in Perfect. Australia. Perfect, yes. Yeah. And I'll be in Australia, hopefully in 2023. Wonderful, wonderful. Melbourne is a place to come to. Okay. <laughs> we, we have a member of parliament here in Victoria State who espouses the most uh, progressive uh, humanist policies. Um, it feels very encouraging uh, to be in Melbourne to listen to Fiona Patton speak and i think there will be a labor government soon nationally so maybe we will have less visits by prime ministers to christian cult meetings so i think many people are looking forward to that that's something to celebrate now todd you you finally have your camera on and you have a raised hand you better ask a question why we still have stuart with us and babu <laughs> Okay, I wanted to talk about um, the changing of what definition of superstition is and what superstitions we may have currently or recently in Western society and how that goes. I give a couple of examples. One was it used to be everybody knew that you get, you get uh, ulcers in your stomach from being a type A personality uh, uh, or being very nervous and that type of thing. And obviously, we now know that that wasn't based on any particular science. It, it was just, gee, it seems reasonable. And it was being given out by people in white coats with stethoscopes. And as was mentioned before, it tends to be you learn it from somebody who's an authority. So we said, gee, the doctor says it. It must be true. Um, right. And now we know that's not true. It wasn't based on any science. It was just based on gee, I have a rabbit's foot and I won the game. Uh, yeah. and, and the other example I'd give, which is more current in the changing, is that it used to be that milk does the body good and that's where you get your calcium and that's, it's a wonderful source of protein. And now uh, it's kind of becoming known that that's basically just because the milk farmers want to sell milk and right. it's not based on science. Like in Canada now, when they do their recommendations for food, they say, well, if you want to have a little milk, it's like the same category as candy now. It, it, but it used to be, you know, that you got to have two glasses of milk every day. And everybody knows that's good. But we talked about how a lot of the superstitions were based on commercial interest. And apparently this was based on, you know, part of just commercial interest. So yeah. I'm wondering, you know, and, and I know that there's different stuff where people will say, now we say we do things based on science, but it's also been quite a few things out that say that a, got a good part of the scientific studies come out are either, I've heard one recently that about 20% are just outright frauds because someone wants to get ahead so they put out something or a company will run a scientific study designed so that it will show that their product is really good, but it's really a very slanted um, uh, study and, and it'll get thrown out after a while but it might not. So how do we deal with this? Um, the things that we as a society think are, we have our current superstitions is what I'm kind of saying. And uh, yes. that will change over time. I can chime in on that and maybe others can too. I, you know, some of what you're talking about, I think are really examples of just the progression of science. There actually was, there were some animal studies that supported that ulcer 
uh, theory before, but I think we've learned more with studies that are done on humans to understand both the process and the effects of ulcers and so on. And so, uh, and you know, you're right about the, the milk example is a great one because uh, at least in the US, you know, the food pyramid, my understanding is the food pyramid recommendations from the FDA have been heavily lobbied, you know, by the, by the mm -hmm. various, you know, food industries. And so I think we have to be skeptical, skeptical about everything, about science, about the things that our government recommends for us. Uh, you know, we, we recently came through a situation where initially they were saying, uh, don't wear masks, masks are not good. And it, it's obvious to me that that was at a time when there weren't enough masks for the health professionals. And so they were trying to keep us from having a run on the mask. It was not science, it was, it was policy. Uh, and so I think you have to keep your eyes open and be skeptical about everything. Ask, ask questions. How do you know what you're telling me? Where's the data that backs it up and so forth? Sometimes it's just progression. I give in my most recent book, I give the example of which I remember very much. I'm being old enough to be that we were told that you had to wait an hour after eating lunch before you go swimming. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And yeah. that was a, and it was based on a certain kind of logic, right? That, you know, your body needed to do this digestion thing and it would be bad to go in the water. We now know that that was completely false. You know, you, you shouldn't have three martinis before going swimming. You know, there is, there's mortality data to tell us that alcohol is dangerous, but you can go right in the water. We just learned better. You know, we had more data. And so that's a false belief that we no longer, uh, no longer hold. And, and to some extent, you know, it wasn't irrational. Uh, we just didn't have enough information at the time. And now we have better information. And so we do it differently. But I think you have to ask questions about everything. I'm thinking that we should start um, a committee called Superstitions for Good. And we start <laughs> circulating a superstition that uh, leaving your cell phone on during the, a theater presentation will bring you bad luck. Uh, <laughs> forgetting to use your blinker when you're turning will bring you a uh, bad luck or an accident. You know, just start <laughs> making people do things for the good of everyone. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody's be heard of the uh, birds aren't real uh, meme yeah. going around, correct? Yeah. So. There you yeah. go. Very clever. <laughs> that was to it? make that was to make fun, I think, of, of the QAnon and and other uh, conspiracy yeah. theories going on. But a guy just came up with it and and just said, you know, birds aren't real. And since then, it's 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 developed in this whole huge uh, meme that that's got literally uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of followers yeah. and, and supporters. It's sort of like street theater or something, you know, it's, it's, it is, it is some people uh, believe it, you know, some people are believing yeah, yeah. it and, you know, that they're yeah. all robots and little, uh, you know, uh, drones and, and all kinds of things. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> There's a huge thing on it. <laughs> um, the, the thing is though, that we get like, for example, the, the thing about swimming, I think that came from like one, it's a lot of times one or two studies will be done and maybe that study showed that, and then no more studies done. And all of a sudden, the entire society will believe right. it. I, mean, I, I grew up being taught that, but it was never, it, it was just like, what I understand, it was just one or two studies were done. And then people said, well, that's just reasonable. Oh. And then we go yeah. on with it. And that becomes, yeah. in effect, the superstition. I and, doubt there were any, I don't think there were even any worse studies at all. I think it was just logic that they were using, bad logic. Yeah. But, but maybe, I, I don't know enough to say, but I do know that I spent a lot of time waiting to get in the water when I probably didn't need to. <laughs> but the other thing is, like, for example, the thing about it comes from a person in authority. And if it comes from authority, then, so, for example, the thing you gave on mass came from Fauci, who was like our yes. top scientist. And so, therefore, it must be right. true. And then we get many change. But then now that has become so well known and whatever. But now there's many studies out that are showing that, gee, maybe it didn't do any good at all to have a mask on in general because people don't know how to wear them. And that's what the scientific studies are showing now. But that still same thing that you said, well, Fauci now says, well, I'm sorry, I lied to you. But and now but it's still people still don't. They, they ignore it. They go with the with what the authority figure said, Fauci, 
instead of what the current science says, which right. now the current science is showing that probably doesn't do anything, even though it seems logical, just like it seems logical for the man hours to go cool, but we go with what the authority said. Right. Not. Right. I mean, we, there's a, there's a need for science education. You know, people need to be able to go deeper than just listening to the authority and to, and to be able to evaluate the source of the evidence and the, the amount of the evidence. So you got to uh, dig a little, digging a little deeper is basically what exactly, you're teaching people exactly. to dig deeper and not just take what the, but you, I mean, like it used to be, we would take what the astrologist would say. That was their authority. <laughs> thinking. Exactly. That was, that was the best we had. Right. So yeah. Anyway. Well, Margaret, I think I'm going to say goodbye, um, All right. but thank you so much. This was really a pleasure. Oh, and I uh, hope, hope to see you sometime you. in person instead of on Zoom. So anyway. All right. Thank All you right. so much. Bye, Stuart. You're welcome. Thanks Bye -bye. so much, Stuart. There's one person I wanted everyone to meet. Zenos Frudakis is my dear friend, world famous sculptor. He is in his studio. He's working on a project for us, the Thomas Paine statue. Yeah, the, the looks Thomas like Paine. Has is in the other room. But look uh, behind Zenos's shoulder. Look at that. Oh, this is Belinsky. And if you, yeah, it's, uh, well, and Darwin is over here. And I'm surrounded by skeptics. <clears throat> Certainly, there have been a lot of sculptures of religious figures, so I'm trying to uh, move things the other way with the clay. But uh, um, I wish I could show you, well, the Thomas Paine is in the other room. I could show it to you, but that's it's, okay. Uh, that's okay, Zenos. It's fine. You can see that I'm working, and I've been listening. It's been very interesting, and um, and edifying. And uh, I'm kind of in a nonverbal mode right now because I'm working in uh, in, uh, in in this material right here, <laughs> plastic. And even your clay is interesting. It's it's uh, it's a certain type of clay that. Well, it hasn't been made for many years, maybe 40, 50 years. It's an old Italian clay. This clay, some of it was used to make the Lincoln Memorial, a lot of other sculptures. And for me, it's been passed down from, other, from sculptor to sculptor, and I'll pass it down when I'm cremated. But uh, maybe I should put some of my ashes in it before I pass it down. And then nice and kind of roll it up. But, um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's nice to know that various it was significant sculptors had their fingers in it, and the tools are also passed down handmade from very well-known sculptors of the past. And more importantly, the ideas of, of how to do sculpture were passed down and something that I appreciate. And I, so today actually would have been the hundredth and first birthday of my half-brother who, who mentored me as, as a sculptor. He died about, he was 98 almost when he died a few years ago. He studied with, uh, with people who studied with Rodin and these things are passed down, this information. So I'm, uh, grateful for it. But anyway, I'm getting off our subject of, uh, of um, superstition. And certainly, I was thinking just while at the end about how people have little sculptures on their, in, on their car dashboard uh, and, uh, and have the superstition that, as George Carlin said, those little religious figures should be watching the traffic instead of looking at them. It's kind of <laughs> But... Uh, but uh, um, you know, and all of you know, and in, in, in India and in other countries, in America, uh, every place they have these big figures that are supposed to be, people will go to them and feel like they're going to get some kind of magic something from this material, which is fairly inert, and that somehow it intrinsically has some power for them. And I guess at a time before words, you certainly see with the Catholic Church, you get you know, religious paintings and sculpture with even Michelangelo sculpture and, and, and so many sculptures were made to move people who were not literate. And then as, as people got more literate, they used, of course, words to also influence their idea of what's real and what isn't real. And uh, people were, I think, um, were bewitched by words and as they were by, the, by sculpture and, and figure. So I like to think I've tried to stay away from any sculpture if people have asked me to do something that is going to contribute to superstition. And um, so I, I, ho I hope I haven't contributed to that, uh, that problem. But 
Well, it's nice to see you. Thank you. Good for to see all of you. Me. It was a great program. Thank it's great you. to hear. Thank you. See you all. And I, I, I wish you well. What I'm talking about. The who we there superstition Won't you tell me dear superstition Are you serious superstition Or just delirious Come on What happened when you learn it ain't that magic Black cat 13 on the lattice Mac crack ring wishbone rabbit ain't me Break triple six circle salt toss would not mind No everybody tell me it's the way Go on. 